Welcome all to the uh, October Ordinary Meeting of Council. Uh, welcome councillors, uh, staff, uh, media, and a special welcome to uh, Pastor Andy Duncan. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for being with us today. It's my pleasure to now open the meeting. Uh, do we have any uh, leave of absence or apologies? I don't believe so. We'll move on. Uh, now I'd like to uh, welcome Pastor Andy Duncan uh, to come up to the lectern and uh, deliver the opening prayers. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for the, the privilege of being able to, to pray for us. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you um, for your goodness for, for this day. Father, this morning we come to you, and, and Father, I thank you for these, your servants, these community representatives, Father, as they seek to, to lead and guide this, this area, Father, this South Burnett. And Father, we pray for your wisdom and your grace and your strength to be with them. And especially during some of these difficult days, Father, I pray for an extra portion of your grace and mercy to fall on them. And Father, we pray for you to, as I said, strengthen them. Lord, give them wisdom in, in all the decisions that they have before them today. Father, we thank you for their service, their willingness to give of themselves for this community. Father, we also want to pray for rain. Father, we pray, we thank you for the little bit yesterday, but we pray that you would continue to send rain. Father, that you would nourish and replenish the, the earth. Father, we pray for you to strengthen and encourage the farmers, those who are greatly impacted by the drought. Father, we pray that they might find strength and hope in you. And Father, we we ask for you to pour out your grace upon this area. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, that was uh, uh, well said and uh, very, very relevant at this point in time, of course. And um, Andy, you're quite welcome to stay and join us, but we'd understand that you'd have a very busy day ahead and uh, we trust that you have a blessed day also. Thank you. Now we're uh, we're often uh, joined by uh, Pastor Max Conlon, who is the elder of the Waka Waka people for our region, uh, to recognise the traditional owners uh, of the land on which we meet today. But uh, Pastor Max, as he often is, is engaged with very important work associated with mental health uh, and couldn't be with us today. So I'd now like to call on uh, Councillor Duff, our, as our Indigenous Affairs Portfolio Holder, to uh, recognise the traditional owners and perform Welcome to Country. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Otto. It's uh, my privilege to do that on behalf of um, Pastor Max Conlon. I'd just like to also um, acknowledge the fact that we now are flying the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag here in the council chambers for the first time. We had the Aboriginal flag and we were waiting on the Torres Strait Islander one, and so they've just arrived. So we're very um, proud that that's now been achieved in our council chambers. I'd also like to um, just uh, acknowledge the fact that um, Pastor Max said that they've had some... Um, quite a few funerals in Cherbourg and he's um, tied up with, with some mental health issues today with um, some of the community members. So I just wanted to, um, you know, spare a thought for um, Cherbourg and our, and our Waka Waka people. So, um, but it is my privilege uh, on behalf of the Waka Waka people to acknowledge country and the traditional owners of the land where we meet today, the Waka Waka people and the elders, both past, present and emerging. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Right, we uh, have a number of items on the agenda today, uh, some of which may give rise to a conflict of interest because we have new legislation now where uh, under that legislation, those regulations, we have two forms of conflict of interest, uh, be that a prescribed or a declarable conflict of interest. Uh, do we have uh, any councillors who uh, wish to declare a conflict of interest in relation to any items on the agenda? Right, I have one item to declare, uh, that is in item in the confidential section, item 17.4, 
in relation to the purchase of commercial property fronting Kingaroy Street, Kingaroy, uh, as I am the director of a company, an accounting practice that has uh, property uh, in the CBD area of Kingaroy, um, I will be uh, declaring a conflict of interest and will be uh, choosing to uh, exit the meeting at item 17.4. If we could have that recorded. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary uh, Linnell. Right, moving on now, uh, item six on the agenda is uh, deputations and petitions. Uh, Mr. C, I don't believe we have any at this point in time today, thank you. Uh, item seven is confirmation of the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 16th of September 2020. Uh, such can be found at six, page six on the agenda. Uh, the meeting, uh, the, the minutes are there and uh, it is uh, the officer's recommendation that the minutes of the council meeting held on 16 September 2020 be received and the recommendations therein be adopted. Do we have a move for such? Thank you, Councillor Jones. A second, I thank you, Councillor Potter. Uh, does any councillor wish to make comment or have any issues in relation to the content of those minutes? Okay, those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you all. We'll now move on to item eight. Point one on the agenda, and it will be my pleasure to deliver the portfolio report in relation to social and corporate performance, people and culture, communications and media, finance, and ICT. Uh, and I could just note that I won't be giving um, a report in relation to people and culture. Um, one, one of our uh, staff have uh, sadly um, had a, um, a loss of a family member and uh, certainly would like to uh, send out our sincere condolences to that staff member, um, but as such, uh, haven't, uh, I haven't uh, required a report from people in culture under, the, under those circumstances, Mr CEO. Okay, well, Council's, uh, first of all, social and corporate performance, and the first item is the implementation of the annual operational plan for 2021. The Council's annual operational plan is adopted by Council prior to the commencement of each financial year. And this plan outlines the activities and actions Council will undertake in accordance with the adopted budget. And at today's meeting, Council will adopt the annual operational plan first quarter review. So it is an opportunity uh, to highlight some of the achievements of Council at this early stage of the financial year, including 500 hours completed in implementing on-ground declared environmental weed control programs, 183,356 wheelie bin collections have been conducted. 17 pieces of legislation have been reviewed for changes to delegations to the Chief Executive Officer. We've had the development and adoption of Council Style Guide to support Council's brand, the implementation, uh, completion of live streaming of Council meetings. Policy governance framework has been developed and adopted by Council and implemented across the organisation. A 10-year works program for the replacement, upgrade and construction of new water and wastewater assets has commenced and a partnership agreement has been signed with Baido to, to deliver the following initiatives, including engagement of a drought resilience officer, implementation of the business extension program, provision of strategic economic support for council and development of an adverse event plan. In communications and media, in September, the media and communications team, again, were very, were very, very busy and progressed a total of 28 media releases, uh, ranging from Australia Day Award nominations uh, right through to staying safe from swooping magpies, as well as a number of other initiatives and activities being undertaken by Council. We had 25 uh, media inquiries, as you can see listed there in the report, uh, ranging from uh, a... Uh, a whole range of uh, matters uh, to do with um, uh, council meetings and uh, ministerial media releases. We had uh, uh, running uh, Butterfactory Park uh, announcements for work being done there in relation to the Alfred Street car park um, and uh, Kingaroy transformation project update. But uh, a number of those there, 25 in total. Social media, we posted uh, 61 items on Facebook and the most popular post uh, was uh, council advertising vacancies, which reached an audience of 7,788 followers. Council South Bend Facebook page ended the month with 7,795 likes and 8,052 followers. Council project progressed one e-news item during September. 
Uh, printed advertising, council progressed two full page advertisements, uh, at page four in the South Bennett today, during August on the 10th and on the 20, uh, sorry, during um, September on the 10th and the 24th of September. Council also progressed one full page ad in the Mergen Moments for what's on at South Bennett Libraries and one half page ad for the region's dams. <clears throat> Council also uh, developed flyers, communities combating pest and weeds during drought program which were uh, disseminated. In terms of finance, uh, the monthly report uh, is, de is designed to illustrate the interim financial performance and position of South Bennett Regional Council compared to the adopted budget at an organisational level for the period ended 30 September 2020. Uh, some key points uh, in the interim financial report includes uh, from the income statement point of view, uh, we have year to date to the end of September, a net oper operating surplus of 9,191,315 dollars. And of course, uh, recurrent revenue is high due to date compared to the large budget, largely due to the six monthly rates being levied during August. So we'll see that uh, obviously phase out over time. This percentage variance will, as I said, slowly decrease over the next few months. In terms of uh, revenue, uh, we have received a revenue of $28,254,537 to the end of September, and our expenditure was $19,063,222. Now, minor timing variances in materials and services under recurrent expenditure are due to the timing and annual invoices, such as land valuations, insurance, fleet registrations, IT licenses, and LGAQ membership. Additional materials and services under disaster management for expenses relating to Queensland Reconstruction Authority grant funding. And this will offset against additional revenue which will be received during the year. Uh, key points to note in Council's balance sheet, uh, in other words, our statement of position, is that year to date at 30 September, Council's total assets stood at $921,245,511. Total liabilities, $56,284,520, uh, with community equity. Uh, in other words, Council's uh, net assets at $864,991. Sorry, $864 in terms of Council's uh, cash at bank, which is held at QTC, the Queensland Treasury Corporation, Council has a total cash balance at 30 September of $49,356,452, of which uh, $22,970,843 is unrestricted and $26,385,609 is restricted cash. Uh, the increase in the cash balance uh, is due to inflows from rates levies, as I said before, being paid by property owners prior to discount period, which ended on the 23rd of September. We've also had a decrease in property plant and equipment balances due to the 1920 comprehensive revaluation of building and land assets. Now, this figure has been revised under the proposed budget first quarter review to be in line with predicted balances for building and land assets for the year. Water and wastewater assets are currently undergoing a comprehensive revaluation, and it is unknown at this stage what effect this will have on property, plant and equipment. Other liabilities balance has decreased due to the Memorandi Estate liability being de-recognised in the 1920 year, in line with the adoption of the new accounting standard AASB 15. The de-recognition of this liability has been adjusted in the proposed budget as part of the force first quarter review. Uh, in terms of the capital budget, I uh, just skipped over that, but uh, the capital budget uh, for this 2021 year is $38,228,662. Now, we did resolve at the last meeting to carry forward, um, sorry, not to carry forward, but to, to roll over $7,370,809 uh, worth of work in progress. That gives us a total spend this year, at the end of the financial year, that'll roll out to 45 million. 599,471, should all broke projects be completed. Uh, to date, we have spent $13,500,865 on capital projects, uh, which constitutes 30% of the total budget for the year. Uh, now, an additional $244,000 is to be added to the budget as per the first quarter review. 
In terms of uh, key points, uh, key ratios, uh, Council's cash ratio is at 10.8. Uh, it should be under audit guidelines greater than three, so Council's obviously doing very well in terms of its cash position. Our operating cash ratio is at 5.03. Again, it should be in target greater than three. Our current ratio is 4.83, so that's our current assets in relation to our current liabilities. So our current assets exceed our current liabilities by a multiple of 4.83. Uh, now that is outside the range, which is normally two to four but that's a good result because it's actually over four. Okay, so we're actually doing better than expected there. Uh, funded long-term liabilities are at 88.3%, which should be greater than 59%. Debt servicing ratio, again, should be less than 10%. We're at 4%. Debt to asset ratio should be less than 10%. We're at 3.5. And uh, interest coverage ratio uh, should be between zero and 5%, and we're at 1.4%. So I guess if that was a blood test, you'd be getting the thumbs up from the doctor. So uh, a good result there for the 30 September quarter. Uh, and can I congratulate uh, the uh, work that has been done by uh, General Manager Jarvis and the finance team. Uh, it's very easy for me to stand up here and rattle off these numbers, but let me tell you, we have a significant uh, budget this council. Um, we certainly are moving towards being uh, more of a medium-sized regional council more than a small council, our budget is quite significant these days, and these guys do a tremendous job in managing what is a, uh, a very large and, um, and sometimes complex uh, set of processes that they've got to deal with. So well done to them, and well done to the departments as well in terms of uh, keeping council's budget pretty well on track to 30 September. Uh, so I'd now like to move that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Mayor's Social and Corporate Performance, People and Culture, Communications, Media, Finance and ICT Portfolio Report uh, be accepted by Council. Thank you very much. Okay, well, do we have a seconder for that? Thanks, Councillor Duff. Now, do any councillors have questions in relation to the contents of, of the report? Everyone's comfortable with that? Okay, well, those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you all. Right, well, we'll now move on to uh, item 8.2 which are the minutes of the Corporate Risk and Audit Advisory Committee meeting, meeting, which was held on Tuesday the 29th of September, and that can be found at 57 in the agenda. And, and so, uh, we, uh, in accordance with requirements of the, um, the local government uh, regulations, uh, Council is required uh, to confirm the minutes of the Corporate Risk and Audit Advisory Committee meeting held on Tuesday 29 September 2020. The committee met liaises on a regular basis with the senior management team, Council's external auditor, Queensland Audit Office and the Fraud, Corruption, Risk Management Coordinator in carrying out its responsibilities. And uh, I can say that uh, the South Burnett Council's, Regional Council's Corporate Risk and Audit Advisory Committee uh, in meeting uh, on the 29th of September, confirmed a number of items and the unconfirmed minutes are provided for Council's consideration uh, and adoption. Uh, overall, I, as chair, in chairing that meeting, I can confirm uh, that the uh, overall was a good result for Council and uh, if I can say, Mr CEO, we got uh, the thumbs up on uh, pretty well all items there. Mm. An unqualified audit report and that's now gone through to the QR, QAO and uh, and been uh, signed off and confirmed. So uh, a good result to all involved. Thank you all. Uh, of course, the audit process is a very comprehensive one. It goes through KPMG, have been here for a number of days. They conduct an extensive audit uh, of all of our, go through us uh, with a fine tooth comb uh, for, a be better one, uh, for a better term. Uh, and of course, in addition to that, it goes off the Queensland Audit Office. So we have a very, very rigorous audit process that we're subjected to as a local government. And, uh, and it was good to see that our council got the thumbs up from KPMG and the Queensland Audit Office. Uh, well done all. But back to the matter at hand, uh, so the council, the officer's recommendation is that council receive the unconfirmed minutes of the Corporate Risk and Advisory Audit Advisory Committee held on Tuesday, 29 September 2020, as presented. Do we have a mover for such? Thanks, Councillor Potter. Seconder, Councillor Fraloff, thank you. Those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you all. On to item 8.3, which can be found at 64. 
Council subscribes to a delegation update service provided by McDonald's Law and has been advised that the following legislation has been revised with delegations to update it accordingly, to be updated accordingly, and it's the Local Government Regulation 2012. I'll just give uh, a summary as to, as to the contents of those changes. So um, the, uh, the regulations will be amended by the Local Government Legislation Integrity Amendment Regulation 2020, which commenced on the 12th of October 2020. Immediately after the commencement of Section 81 of the Electoral and Other Legislation Accountability and Other Matters Amendment Act 2020, the amendments to the Act consist of changes to, one, promote transparency, accountability and consistency in relation to the requirements for organisation and conduct of meetings of a local government and a committee of the local government. Two, promote transparency, accountability and consistency in relation to registers of interest. Three, provide the following matters in relation to council advisers. Prescribe which local governments may engage advisers and the maximum number of advisers that may be appointed by councillors in those local governments. Of course, for our council, uh, being, a, being a smaller council, uh, that is nil. The criteria to which the Remuneration Commission must have regard when making a recommendation to the Minister about about making a regula regulation relating to advisors and register of interest requirements for advisors and persons related to them. Four, approve a new code of conduct for councillors under the uh, local government regulations to implement recommendation two of the government's response to the Yabba report and to reflect the new process in the Integrity Act for managing councillors' conflict of interest. And five, make other minor and consequential amendments as necessary. So the officer's recommendation is that pursuant to section 257 of the Local Government Act 2009, Council 1 delegate the exercise of the powers contained in Schedule 1 of the instrument of delegation attached to this resolution as appendix to the Chief Executive Officer. These powers must be exercised subject to any limitations contained in Schedule 2 of the attached instrument of delegation and two, repeal all prior resolutions delegating the same powers to the Chief Executive Officer. Do we have a mover for such? Thanks, Councillor Schumacher, a seconder. Thanks, Councillor Henschen. Uh, does any councillor wish to speak for or against the motion? If not, those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you all. <clears throat> we'll now move on to item 8.4, which is the annual operational plan at 75. And um, there's quite a uh, significant report there in relation to the annual operational plan. Overall, the council's annual operational plan details the projects, services and initiatives that council planned to deliver in the 2021 financial year. So pursuant to section 174.3 of the local government regulation 2012, a report must be presented to council at regular intervals detailing the progress towards the implementation of the plan. In the course of the development of the first quarter progress report, it was prudent to review the annual, op annual operational plan key activities. And as a result of, of the review, amendments were made as identified within the report. Uh, the amendments that were made are, as I said, uh, detailed there, and uh, they're available uh, for those who've got uh, the agenda to, to uh, work through. Happy for councillors uh, to ask questions or comment in relation to those, but the officer's recommendation is that uh, Sapponet Regional Council Annual Operational Plan 2021 Implementation Progress Report for the period 1 July 2020 to 30 September 2020 be adopted as presented. Do we have a mover for such? Thanks, Councillor Potter. Seconder, Councillor uh, Duff, thank you. Right, does any councillor have any questions or wish to raise any comments? Councillor Schumacher, thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, certainly want to acknowledge, I, I think the changes here certainly reflect a lot of the discussions in which council has had um, in its recent workshops and portfolio discussions. Um, I just wanted to ask a question just in relation to the rate category review. Um, and I note here it's a key activity that's been deferred for 2021-22. Um, I just wanted to confirm that um, we were doing some other work around um, our rating categories and the like, our, our budget in a sense, yes, if that's possible. Yep, no, certainly. Thank you for the question and, and the clarification. So um, 
the 2021 or 21 22 is a flag for there's going to be further work done next year we actually uh with mead perry who we've used previously we had a meeting with them yesterday through to a range of um, other commitments was the first time we could get together with them as far as mapping it out i think without telling tales our school first workshop will be on the 6th of november so at the time of writing the report with the activity that had happened in the first quarter we hadn't got the dates in place so there will be a range of the categories um, with rates it's always a fine tuning uh, type of a process and also um, taking very clearly on board the discussion with um, staff and also uh, Mead Perry is that um, things are done with time to be able to actually discuss that matter much more openly and in public so some of the changes so rather than trying to rush changes through uh, before Christmas or something like that just for sake of example not that we were um, that we've actually can fully discuss it and then also go out to the affected parties and uh, by co and that's will come through the workshop process and then ultimately a report to council is how do we want to do that engagement as a part of that workshop so first one I think general manager will be 6th of November and then it'll be rolling on the other one if I may uh, just which is a bit of an aside of that is um, in running in parallel while we have um, expertise in the room we'll be having a conversation with you about depreciation so we'll run those through workshops as well so thank you for the question yeah thank you mr ceo uh council are you comfortable with that response yes thank you mr mayor i'm glad to hear depreciation is um hot on our agenda yeah so just to confirm that council will be progressing with uh, a review of the rating uh, system the rating categories that will happen across two financial years and uh, we'll be engaging Mead Perry to lead that process and uh, folding into that uh, a review of the depreciation uh, process for councils a couple of those key, key asset classes for council right uh, if there's no further questions uh, those in favor of the motion resolution passed unanimously thank you all automate automate point five is at 122 And that is in relation to the monthly financial report and first quarter budget revision. Um, the, um, and, I, and I have uh, effectively given, I think, a fairly detailed summary of that, Mr. CEO, in my portfolio report. Uh, so if councillors are comfortable with that, I'll move straight to uh, the recommendation, which is that the monthly financial report, including Capital Works and Works for Queensland, quarter three, as it's 30 September 2020, be reviewed, received, sorry, and noted uh, that in accordance with section 173 of the local government regulation 2012 the revised 2021 operational budget be adopted and in accordance with section 173 of the local government regulation 2012 the revised capital budget be adopted do we have a mover for such thank you councillor shoemaker a seconder thank you councillor froloff uh councillors uh, does any councillor wish to speak for or against the motion mr ceo May I just preempt in case there is a question? There was some discussion about the different funding programs and the capital programs. Um, previously, not in, a, in this meeting, said there are some uh, conditions, well, there are a lot of conditions are tied with external funding. So we are planning to get you, and I haven't had an opportunity to brief you all collectively, so I've only spoken to the mayor about it is that uh, we will get you all together so we're getting the after this first quarter review the works for queensland round three and COVID, the drought funding and the capital programs and we'll sit down with you as a group and workshop them all through then what changes you, you may wish you may wish to make to that program what's been started what hasn't been started but also then we will have to go back to the funding agency so rather than trying again trying to rush it through today we're we're pulling back on a couple of these things to make sure that they don't have to be come back as a second time. So we will workshop all those capital programs with you. So it hasn't been forgotten. It just, yeah, timing and getting everyone together between now and the last meeting. Yeah, thank you, Mr. CEO. And that'll of course give councillors an opportunity uh, to fine tune uh, the allocation of that uh, that expenditure across those funding programs. Councillor Schumacher. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to acknowledge it's a fantastic report, um, the financial report that's been put before us. There's some great commentary in there, and I'd certainly encourage our community to take a look. I think it really provides a deeper understanding of 
um, Council's financial sustainability and uh, the projects and things that are underway this financial year. So I'd just like to acknowledge the work of GM Jarvis and the finance team. It's a fantastic report um, and it really is a great tool in terms of guiding this council going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Uh, thank you, um, General Manager Jarvis, and of course the departmental heads involved in that process as well. Uh, so just in a summary there, if I can, uh, for, for the benefit of councillors and for the community, uh, councillors' net operating result in the 2021 budget is expected to be a deficit of $3,675,499. Uh, now, of course, as we have highlighted before, a significant contributor towards that deficit is the increased depreciation the council will realise this year in relation to our uh, building assets, and uh, that will be part of the body of work that will be undertaken in reviewing such, as Mr. CEO has highlighted, uh, when uh, Mead Perry work us through that process of, of uh, looking at our rates and our revenue for the next year. So we'll continue to work away at that, uh, at that deficit, uh, but of course the depreciation uh, cost to council is a significant con contributor to such. Uh, the, uh, the expected uh, recurrent, uh, so, so in getting that result, the expected uh, revenue for this financial year is $67,092,117. And to get that deficit, the recurrent expenditure is expected to be 70 million seven hundred and $67,616. Um, certainly our, our deficit is not going to be anywhere near as significant as that of the uh, federal budget under COVID. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, but we will certainly be working actively, assure the community uh, to uh, balance the budget as, as best we possibly can, while continuing to deliver essential services uh, right across the region to uh, to all of our communities. Community equity at the end of the uh, financial year is expected under the budget to come in at $890,043,162. Right, uh, we'll now uh, put the motion to the vote. Uh, those uh, in uh, favour? Resolution passed unanimously, thank you all. We'll move on to item 8.6 which is a quote for the replacement of a John Deere 670G grader and can be found at 174. So uh, a little bit of background on this item 8.6 uh, is that um, council engaged local buy uh, to prepare tender documentation and obtain written quotes from Hastings, Hastings Deering, John Deere and Komatsu. The Komatsu GD 555-5 is recommended for purchasing as the grader meets the specifications requested and is competitively priced. Council currently have two GD 555-5 graders operating in road construction and major maintenance crews, producing good results. Uh, now there's a lot more detail uh, in the agenda report, uh, which outlines the comparison between uh, the different uh, models that were assessed and you can see there that uh, there were four quotes obtained across uh, two from John Deere, one from Komatsu and one from Hastings Deering. Uh, so uh, I'll, uh, the officer's recommendation here is that South Bennett Regional Council purchase from Komatsu, the Komatsu GD555-5 for $365,000 excluding GST to replace the ageing grader plant number 1502 at 10.5 years old in line with the 10 year replacement plan for graders. Do we have a mover for such? Thank you, Councillor Jones, a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Hensham. Uh, I'll now call for councillors wishing to speak uh, for or against the matter. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I just wanted to, um, to just, um, I know we're doing a full fleet review and I just wanted to ask the question about uh, where this particular purchase sits with the full fleet review and also um, over the course of my term of council, we've always said, have we got enough graders? And, and, and um, I just wanted to know where we sit as far as I think from what, what I'm seeing and hearing on the ground that we've got adequate grade, graders on and the, they, as far as the fleet goes in, in uh, road construction, that we've got the, the right gear. I'd just like to comment around that and the full fleet review and where we're at with that. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Councillor. Through you, Mr Mayor. Um, yes, you're correct, Councillor. We are in the process of doing a full fleet review. Um, this specific plant was identified in our 10-year uh, greater replacement program and it's, it's an essential um, plant to, um, for our road construction crew. The average utilisation rate last year was 86%. So um, part of the review is that these essential plant that must be replaced still are being replaced while we're reviewing the rest of the, the plant and fleet. We actually have a, another meeting after the council meeting this afternoon to review that. So I will give this to General Manager Meehan and he can um, let you know about the construction side of it. That's outside my area of expertise. Thank you. Sorry, General Manager Meehan, while you're addressing that question, if I could also just add uh, to the question. Um, uh, it's a 12-foot blade. Uh, is there consideration to a 14-foot blade grader? And will this new grader be able to pull a five-tine uh, ripper as against a three-tine ripper? Through, through you, Mr. Mayor, I don't know much about construction gear, so I'll take that on notice. So. <laughs> Absolutely accept that. I, thanks, um, thanks, General my, my, my official answer to that is um, the good news is I don't drive the machines and I don't choose the machines, so we take the recommendations. So I, um, all I know is the difference between a 12-foot blade and a 14-foot blade is two foot, Mr. Mayor. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to answer the, the councillor's question through you, Mr Mayor, um, we are reviewing the, the fleet in partnership with finance, which is which has been really good. So we've made a really good start there to look at white fleet and yellow fleet. Um, we've identified a number of machines there that we're working through um, collaboratively with the with the fleet group too. So nothing will be replaced unless it's it's warranted. Um, the good news is the graders, because the graders are are in full full swing here through construction and maintenance, we've um, it is due for replacement and we've validated that actually should happen. So um, any machine that comes up for replacement through Susan and myself um, gets vetted by us now. So to make sure that those machines are, are definitely required. Um, and if there's a, a change to that, then obviously we'll come back to council and talk through through future budgets and those sort of things. So I'd just like to say we're having a, a great support from Susan um, and her team. Um, and it's one thing I think we're gonna get a really good result just reviewing through those numbers. So it's been good. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, General Manager. Uh, Councillor Henshin. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Could I just direct a question uh, in relation to the rippers? I think that's relative to what the conditions are and, and five rippers you might pull at 100 mil and three rippers you might pull at 200 mil. But could I just direct a question in relation to the quotes? On the, John Deere, on the two John Deere quotes, we have a figure there um, which is $653.05 in both columns against the Komatsu and the Hastings of 365,000. Can you just verify? Uh, obviously, that's a, some form of misprint there, is it? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. I um, just to probably answer on behalf of Susan, that'll be an error in the sheet. That'll be a payment system that's been made. So the table that's gone into the report has probably got an error in it um, in relation to the John Deere's. But the actual recommendation would be back with the spreadsheet that's got an analysis behind that as part of the tenant consideration plan. So um, I'd probably just suggestion to Susan and take it on notice and maybe just circulate that table with the value for reference in, in future, if, if that was uh, okay. Yeah, Councillor Hedgeson, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I, I just thought I would suggest that possibly be $363,500 perhaps. Uh, and, and in relation to the Komatsu, I, in reading this, Specifications and a 12 foot blade was mentioned. Um, that's fairly and important that's to council because it comes in under width. Once we go over width with some of these machines, it creates some other issues in transportation around the, the burn it. So I think this is a, a great result. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. And you know, I guess my uh, questions there aren't because I've driven a grader. Um, but I have had, uh, if, if I could say, uh, in doing my uh, due diligence as a councillor, I have uh, had conversations with. Uh, X greater drivers and they suggested that perhaps a five tine could result in greater efficiencies as against a three tine where you're not having it will take a lot less time to actually undertake the ripping work and that a 14 blade enables uh, the drains to be done a lot more effectively uh, than a 12 foot blade so I think there's possibly an efficiency productivity gain with that uh, whether they are realistic options in the modern era I just don't know general manager 
Uh, I'm probably feeling a little bit uncomfortable um, myself personally at this stage about uh, progressing this matter. And um, Mr. CEO, am I able to perhaps uh, suggest that the matter be adjourned until we get more information or have we got the resolution on the table? You've got it moved and seconded, Mr. Mayor, so um, I think proceed, but um, given the concerns that you've raised and, well, the questions more so that uh, General Manager's me and point about if we bring back a um, another batch of information for councillors about why and the hows and the specs and we can inform as to why the purchase has been recommended as it has. Yeah, yeah thanks, Mr CEO. Um, General yeah, Manager. Just through you, Mr Mayor, in relation to the... I was probably being a bit um, flipping with the greater blade. So the, the blades are different sizes between a 12 foot and a 14 foot. So it normally depends on the size of the machine. You can use a 12 foot blade quite comfortably on a rural road to, to do drains and those sort of things. The issue that you have with a 14 foot blade sometimes is when we're using that machine, particularly in urban areas where there's tight turning, it can work against you. Um, so I, I would just say in, in relation to the operators and their feedback, these machines are vetted by the works coordinators in, in purchase, so the guys who run those unsealed programs. So um, depending on what use the machine has got, um, what I would recommend is if you've got feedback from people in relation to the machine, they should be bringing that up directly with the works coordinators. Uh, yeah, no, but just if, 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 um, if you've got people who, who want to have a chat about it, we, we would be more than welcome to sit down and, and have, a, have a chat with some with about the tines and those sort of things. Because um, the machines, there's been cases where we've, we've um, gone and bought a 14 foot and I've actually thought a 12 foot would be, would be a better machine. Um, they can be, they're, they're, the issue with them too is the horsepower on them is quite high now, so they're quite efficient anyway. Um, the other thing is too, depending on where this machine is placed, with the drains and those sort of things, um, it's likely that this machine will go into a construction um, and it will go to, to one of the tier one, the, the high tier construction crews and the bigger machines will be sent out to the, to, with the 14 foot blades out to the rural areas. So um, generally if we're doing, 100% agree with you, if we're doing um, maintenance grading out in the, um, like the, the rural program, 12 foot blade, you definitely go to a 14 foot. So your comments are quite right. I think it's just that the fact is that if they've recommended a 12 foot, it'll be depending on where this machine is being placed with the construction fleet, Mayor, if that if that helps, rather than leave it on the it's it would have been it would have been deemed as fit for purpose by the works coordinators in that tender, if that helps. Yeah, thanks, General Manager. Obviously there's a lot more factors at play here. I'm probably taking a simplistic view of the matter. Um, and, and of course, uh, probably just the other question was the old grader, what what do we actually do with the old grader then? Sorry. Not working now. Um, my understanding is at this stage that the uh, the fleet crew still put them through to auction at the moment. One of the re uh, fleet reviews that we'll be looking at is an option for trade and for, for public disposal as part of our, our new way forward. So, um, and we'll be bringing in a, um, a whole of life cost model as well to, to support those recommendations as well. So traditionally, don't uh, without, um, Without being quoted on it, traditionally they've gone to public auction through pickles and those sort of elements, but this machine may be traded, but normally it would be listed in the report if it's been traded directly with the purchase, so if that assists. Thanks, General Manager. Uh, Councillor Jones. Yeah, <coughs> excuse me, thanks, Mr Mayor. I just, um, uh, the General Manager's just um, crossed off on exactly what I was going to respond with to, in regards to your questions, and uh, they were legitimate questions. and. Um, our blokes or our feedback and all that sort of stuff are the people that are using the graders and know what I, th I think they know exactly what's best for the conditions that we work in. And uh, I think Aaron has crossed off on, on the fact that where this machine will be located, the uh, 12 foot blade will be the beneficial and then we put the 14 foot um, blades and all that sort of stuff out there. And Councillor Hanchin has uh, touched on it before with the rippers. Yep, five, five tines to three tines conditions. You, you put five tines down in rough country, mate, with rocky country and all that sort of stuff, it does pull them up. It all depends on horsepower and all that. So it's horses for courses. And I think that Aaron uh, has pretty much covered up on that, but legitimate question. So I just want to you know, reiterate the staff feedback. They're the people that are out there using it. So we've got to rely on their, their feedback, I think, for that. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Jones. Uh, can we confirm that uh, the driver of this vehicle, will it be one driver or multiple drivers, General Manager, and have they been consulted, as you, Councillor Jones has indicated? Yeah, so so the, the fleet is actually placed um, in, the, in the pool itself, so it couldn't be driven by anybody. Again, the feedback will come through from the works coordinators in, in, in the program. So there's a group review between 
the um, the overseer and the works coordinators in the fleet group to go through to make sure the machines fit for purpose. So they they vet the horsepower, the size of the blades, the rippers, those sorts of things. Um, the other thing is to um, if yeah, there you go, just in the communication consultation. So it's gone through the works coordinators. There, Susan's just um, just tapped me on the shoulder. Um, as far as the driver goes, normally the guys will get the feedback through the unseal group too, where it's going to go. I look at that machine there. It would be um, it would be a high probability that's going to be placed in construction given the size of that machine. So um, to give you an idea, once we start the Kingroy transformation and those sort of projects. Those sort of areas, you definitely want to be using a 12-foot machine, a uh, 12-foot blade machine, and those sort of things. So, um, but uh, to be honest, man, I appreciate the questions. I think that's good feedback, and, and happy to take that up with the guys. And I think the other thing is too is um, we can probably just Susan and I say we'll just probably just review these reports in future, and we can probably you know beef up some of that information in there as well, um, and then possibly look at um, maybe doing an overview of the machines and how they work as well as far as a future workshop as well. If if you're happy. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Chair Manager. I think that'll be a really good uh, process. Um, and certainly not wanting to frustrate the decision today, uh, but wanting to make sure we're spending a serious amount of money here uh, and want to make sure that we've done our due diligence correctly. Have absolute faith in the works coordinators. Just want to make sure that, you know, that the, the, that the guys using the guys and gals using the vehicle, uh, uh, these machinery are comfortable with them. They're going to get the productivity we need. And I suppose I just, when I saw that we've gone from 172 kilowatt back to 144, I was concerned about the 144's capacity um, when you start, if you're look, looking to pull five times or you're looking for heavier work, um, and whether we would have been better to perhaps look at spending a little bit more and getting a, 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 a machine with greater uh, pulling capacity. But again, you know, works coordinators are expecting they've done their due diligence. So thanks very much, General Manager. Uh, Councillor Schumacher, you've been waiting for a while. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the discussion. Certainly, I had some questions to ask at the last time we brought a grader, so um, I really appreciate, I think, the staff have included a lot more information about whole of life costs in terms of maintenance, um, which is really good. And um, I just probably had more of a question um, around, I'm sort of hearing what everyone's saying in terms of the, the fleet and plant review, and I see how that's really important work. Um, I'm more interested in the, the timeline in terms of when that review will be finalised because my concern, I'm probably a little hesitant to buy new equipment at this point in time until that review's completed. So I just wanted to understand the timeline for the actual review and when that comes back to council. Yeah, so the, the first stage of the review is, a, is an operational review between um, the GMs and basically we'll go through and, and vet the um, plant and that's basically looking to see to make sure that we have a fleet that's being utilised correctly. Um, so that process is, is well and truly in, in, entrenched now. So what will happen there is there'll be a, an increase in utilisation of machines and any disposal of machines will be brought back to council for, for review. As far as purchasing the graders, we have done a review of the graders and at this stage we're recommending that the grader be replaced because we see no reason to, to reduce the graders. The reason for that is that um, all those machines are in use, so they're either in a construction crew or they are on the patrol grading program now. So there's no, there is no surplus graders within our fleet. So hence the utilisation is up around 86% right now, which is very, very good for a, for a council. So um, any changes to, to the, the fleet will be operationally managed by Susan and myself, um, but any disposal of surplus equipment will be brought back through council for resolution. So you will we'll obviously be in, entrenched with that as well. Um, I would think that probably post Christmas, Susan and I will have some recommendations around, around, you know, some strategies that we might put in place in that space, if that's okay. Thanks, General yeah. Manager. Uh, Councillor Schumacher. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, certainly think that's that's a great way forward. Just want to ensure, you know, when we're having these discussions, that there is um, that we are considering the whole of life costs, because I imagine this grader hasn't been the grader that we're replacing is 10 and a half years old. So this grader, will it be on a 10 year rotation as well? Yes? Yeah. Yep. So what, what would happen is um, part of that fleet policy review is we'll bring council a um, fleet replacement policy, so a fleet management policy, so you'll have a formal one. Most graders you hold between 10 and 15. Um, there's been some that we've actually held older than that, just depends on the nature of your fleet and your cash flow and those sort of things. There's probably a few things to review as we just re basically reset the fleet, I suppose, through that policy as well. So some machines will be a bit younger, some will be older. It's like um, any assets, sometimes they can 
uh, hold on a bit longer and you might put them out to maintenance or something like that. Other ones you actually might dispose of early, just like if you bought a yeah. car and, and that sort of stuff. But generally you would be looking to hold a major yellow fleet item like this between 10 and 12 years. Um, so it's in, in line with its replacement. We actually held one back last year um, because of we wanted to rotate the extra grader through and obviously that saves us money as well. So um, we're basically um, getting the, the graders back on cycle. So 10.5 years is, is right on line with when we should be disposing of this item as a council. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Schumacher and General Manager. Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Aaron, but with the 10-year um, rollover plan that uh, Councillor Schumacher has just uh, alerted to, it falls into line with our 10-year operational plan and all that sort of stuff moving forward and our future uh, proposals. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but we need the graders. We've got the greater numbers that we have now. Uh, we'd like to have more, but... What, we need, what we've got we need. When we do the plant and fleet review, we would more likely be targeting bobcats, backhoes, loaders, utes, and that sort of stuff. The, the graders are a critical part to our infrastructure program. And um, yeah, so is that correct in, in saying that? Yeah, so, so what I'll just highlight to Council is that your fleet should be fit for purpose and value for money. They're the two things that you're looking for. So the part of what Susan and I do is we go through each type of, of, of item of plant and we just review how many we own, what's its utilisation. Um, just because something might have its utilisation slightly down, you might have um, reasons for that. So you might own uh, machines in, in some of your rural depots because you might have a water main break in the middle of the night, so you'll own those items because that's what you need. Um, again, I'll just, just, just drum on the fact that the fleet should be fit for purpose for your business. Um, and that means some machines will offer different levels of value. The important thing is that we're getting the appropriate return for our business. So, and that's what Susan and I are betting through. In line with the graders is making sure that um, graders is a perfect example where you know how many you need to own, you own that amount of machines, then you start to roll, rotate them through for replacement so that they remain in service is what you're looking for. So as far as the graders goes, um, Again, yeah, we'd love to have more. We are budgeted for the amount that we have um, and we don't own any more than we should. So um, therefore, I'd say our greater fleet is fit for purpose. What we look at now is the machine is due for replacement. We've budgeted for that in our capital program. It's important that they make sure that we, we try and replace the machines to closest to their life as possible. Otherwise, we see maintenance costs and those sort of things. And we also see loss of productivity and machines go down. So, um, so yeah, I, I just support the recommendation from the officers that the machine is, is due for replacement. Um, and it's, it's had its proper due diligence uh, in that space. Sorry. Thanks, General Manager. Me. Um, yes. May I just add to that? The first sweep, um, there's more science obviously involved in these reviews, especially with our yellow plant and that, because they're vital to our um, revenue and construction um, within council. However, the first sweep of our white uh, plant, we've now um, sold 15 vehicles within our white plant. So that was an immediate thing where we could see that um, it was impacting on us financially. So that's just one result. But like I said, there needs to be more science now with the rest of our fleet. We'll be looking at utilisation rates of ages, operators, uh, more in depth. Thanks, General Manager. That's an important body of work. Uh, and the white, just for clarification for councillors and for the community, uh, we've sold 15 of the white fleet. Uh, white fleet, is that primarily uh, utilities, those sorts of vehicles? Oh, yes, that's correct, Mr Mayor. Thanks, General Manager. Okay, Councillor Jones. Yeah, just one last thing, Mr Mayor. I'd just like to uh, say that it's been a, uh, this uh, plant and fleet review that we're talking about Currently, um, it's been 12, 18 months in the making and uh, can I just say that I'm glad that we're to the point now where we're starting to look at that and that uh, reduction in the white fleet in particular. We get a lot of criticism about uh, the amount of utes that are driving around with one person, all that sort of stuff. And I'm sure the uh, staff and the general managers here will do exactly the right thing and make sure that our staff aren't um, cut short of any vehicles or any uh, um, fit for purpose vehicles that we have or need in our fleet. So. Uh, I'm so happy to, it's been 18 months in the making from the previous council and I'm finally glad to see some action starting to take place. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Jones. Good to see that that body of work is continuing from the previous council to the new council. And of course, Councillor Jones highlighted uh, it's, uh, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we are uh, spending, uh, every dollar that we spend of, of ratepayers' money 
is done so very uh, responsibly and accountably and reviewing our fleet, our utilities, our vehicles generally, yellow and white across the region is an important part of that. So thank you very much, uh, General Manager, for the body of work that you and your staff are doing. Councillor Henshin. Yeah, just quick, quickly, Mr Mayor and, and councillors. Just again, I don't want to bore everybody with specifications, but I support this in the fact that uh, if I put my rural hat on and my mechanical hat on, this is a machine that's replacing a 10-year-old machine, which is good to see that the quotes that came in that we haven't gone down the path of electronic joystick controlled machines because anybody and I'm sure our operators within our establishment will transverse from their old machine straight to this. Those that know electronic over hydraulic joysticks on machinery takes a little bit to come to grips with. Also note there that we have complimentary services for this machine for two years. That's a wonderful thing. I think that needs to be noted as well. The size of the machine, as I stated before, comes in under, under legal width, which um, saves with uh, oversized signs and flags. And 10 years ago, when the grader that we're replacing with this proposal, I can rest assure you that the efficiency of machines 10 years later would be far greater than what they were 10 years ago. So I think this is a, is a, great, it's a great quote and would be a great result. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Henshin. Does any other councillor wish to make comment at this stage? Speak for or against? No? Or Councillor uh, Duff? Um, I, ha um, <laughs> I know this is going on and we're labouring the point, but I, I had similar feedback to the, to the Mayor, but I couldn't um, put it eloquently like him about the, the size of the, of the um, particular um, blade. So I, all I just want to ask from what I've heard back is that the... the 14 foot, we're getting the 12 foot one and the 14 foot one. So the 12 foot one is for construction and the 14 foot one is for maintenance. So we're, we're, this one here is now a 12 foot one. Is it going to, do we definitely know it's for construction as opposed to maintenance or are we, do we mix and match them around or like, because I did have a similar feedback to the mayor. Yeah, look, through you, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Um, in relation to the blade size, I'll leave it to the works coordinators to decide what they think is, is appropriate. The machines can do both. I've worked at councils where all machines have been 12 foot blades. Um, and I've worked in ones where we've used 14 foot blades, um, where the blades can be um, too big. The big thing is making sure the machine has got the right power for its size and its weight, which it has according to the report. So I've actually seen that Komatsu machine. It's, it, it is a fine, it, there's no issue with the machine. As far as the width of the blades and those sort of things, I personally um, don't have an opinion either way. I, I leave it to the works coordinators to decide what they think is, is the appropriate thing for the fleet. At the end of the day, if you've got a 12 or a 14 foot, there's pros and cons in both columns, just making sure the machine has got versatility as well. You can do drains, like that machine would be fine to do maintenance grading. The 12, the 14 foot is, is can push more material because it's a wider machine. You have transport costs and issues like that as well in relation to that. So. Um, I see no issue with the 12 foot. And if they'd recommended a 14 foot because they had a reason for the 14 foot, that's fine as well. So um, I, I leave it to the works coordinators to decide what machines that they, what they think is the best best suit for what they're purchasing. They might come back with a recommendation on the next machine to go 14 foot, depending on what they want to use it for. So, But uh, the feedback's been good. I, good questions, I'll be going back to have a chat with the lads about it before we come up with the next one. So, And I, I think it's important too that the questions that were raised here, it, it's it's a great opportunity for us to get the guys in and do a bit of unsealed and grading and just walk council through some of the some of those exact questions for you. Um, but also welcome if you are getting feedback from anybody, welcome that to come through to us and, and have a chat with those with those people as well. No no qualms at all with that. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Oh, thanks, General Manager. Me, and it's good to see that the staff are obviously open to getting that advice from the community. Um, but uh, obviously, we uh, works coordinators also know what they're doing. Put faith in our staff. Okay, well, we've had a significant uh, conversation. I often talk about having full-throated debates. So we've had one on this, and that's very important. That's the democratic process. Uh, so well done, everybody. Uh, we're now, uh, we have the motion on the table. Uh, we'll now put that uh, to the vote. Uh, those in favour? Those against? Okay, resolution passed six votes to one. Uh, all in favour except for Councillor Otto, who voted against. Right, thank you all. Item 8.7, which is the adoption of Council's Code of Conduct, uh, Council's 
conduct of council and committee meetings policy at 176. And I might just uh, refer to Mr. CEO, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Now, councillors, this one you have noticed has got, got the attachments. Uh, the Mayor has, um, and my recommendation to you today as we leave it on the table, I wanted to leave the report in, um, the new tranche of legislative reform to both the Act and particularly the local government regulations took effect on the 12th of October. We went through uh, a range of training with the department and actually LGAQ as well as our own research. The department released the, released the model guidelines on the, in, on, on the internet as the way they do for the meeting procedure. We, we rewrote ours to take the uh, impact of the changes to the regulation and circulated that. Um, and I'll go through a couple of specific examples, but I just wanted to talk about it today. So that came out Thursday afternoon, um, Friday. By the time we had a look at it, um, there was significant change, or there is significant change, as the Mayor alluded to earlier, in both, um, well, material personal interest doesn't exist anymore. It's now a prescribed, personal, a prescribed conflict of interest. The old perceived conflict of interest is now just a conflict of interest. There's quite a range of rewording of that section of the model guidelines. The uh, department has stripped the model guidelines down, so what was once 23 pages is now 16 pages. And in doing that, they lost, um, and I don't want to sound like I'm speaking ill of the department, but uh, they lost significant points that we still need in the meeting procedures. And they make it very clear what they put out is just the very basics. So you must adopt their basics and then build upon it. So if we went straight to the model today, we'd actually be doing this council a disservice because we would lose parts and we would have to bring the meeting uh, standing orders back in a subsequent meeting. And also to be fair to you and the seniors, well, to all involved in the council meeting process, not just the senior staff, but the staff that write, write the reports, um, we have made the decision to leave the report in here so I could bring it to your attention as to why the attachment's not in there. We have had um, myself and several staff working on these things. Um, I did a fair bit on Sunday again with them. We had staff working on Monday, Tuesday. We would have got them out to you last night. The chances of there being an error was like seriously high. Um, so my suggestion is we leave it on the table so we don't just have to come back and fix anything we missed at the November meeting. The uh, other difficulty which I may um, with our colleagues at uh, state level, the legislative amendments to the Act and the regulations are still not on legislation online. So when you go to legislation online, which is the most up-to-date version of our regulations, it still has the wrong list for the reasons to close a meeting, for example. So the legislation has only been updated as of 2nd October, not 12th October. So even to rely on, the, and you'll see in future report, I've got highlighted a whole heap of sections. We don't know exactly if they've renumbered the regulations, if they've done those sorts of, now they're administrative, they, they really have no material impact. But the ability to close a meeting, we had actually um, gone through and updated uh, our current uh, procedures for closed meetings. The tenders we moved early with the tenders, for example, the conversation you just had once, well previously, um, two months ago, that would have been enclosed. That's now all in open, which is good, which is a good thing. Um, so yeah, so we're, again, without going on too long, the department has just released the information so late in the meeting process cycle that we would not be able to give you fair time to consider the changes. And there are significant changes in the regulations that will impact the way that meetings are run. It may not seem so on the surface, but certainly the mechanics of these meetings, there will be significant change. So uh, my request is that we just leave the report on the table. We've logged it today. We can, uh, with hand on heart, and we will go back and we are giving the department feedback on, on this process, is that we are willing and have already moved to implement a number of the changes but we need to um, really go through those model procedures and see the devils in the detail and the fine print, see what they have changed and what they've done by regulation. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. CEO. Uh, look, I've listened carefully to what you've uh, stated there, and I think you've certainly um, um, uh, provided sufficient grounds, I would have thought, uh, uh, such that I'm uh, prepared to move a motion that the matter 
uh, lay on the table, be adjourned until the November Ordinary Meeting of Council, uh, giving our uh, staff the appropriate time to uh, obviously um, obviously uh, get that information from the department. Uh, so the, res uh, the resolution is that the matter lay on the table, be adjourned, in other words, uh, until the November meeting. Do we have a second for such? Thanks, Councillor Jones. Uh, those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. Uh, thank you, councillors, and uh, particularly thank you, Mr. CEO, for the uh, very diligent work you've uh, undertaken. I expect that our council is probably uh, at the forefront of the implementation of the legislation in some ways, if I can say, um, somewhat perhaps controversially, that we're probably even ahead of the department. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Ms. Mr. CEO. Mr. Mayor, just a, we're the first council to bring the report. So with Monday, with the, it was always going to be tight with the cycle, but yeah, we certainly are. So there will be legislation always overrides policy, so we'll defer back to the regs when we've got a clear copy. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Mr CEO. Good to see that our council is well and truly, uh, our staff are well and truly, our executive are well and truly uh, on the ball when it comes to implementing uh, new legislation and regulations. This uh, only came to effect on Monday, and here we are discussing it already two days later. Uh, so congratulations and well done. We we'll look forward to that coming to the November meeting. We'll now move on to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is uh, item, item 8.8, .8, which is at uh, 178, and uh, the Council's annual report is required to be adopted in accordance with the Local Government Act 2009 and the Local Government Regulation 2012. Therefore, it is necessary for Council to confirm the date, time and location of the special meeting to ensure compliance. And the officer's recommendation is that the special meeting of council to be held, uh, be held on Wednesday, 28 October, 2020 in the Warren Trust Chamber, Glendon Street, Kingaroy, commencing at 9 a.m. Do we have a mover for such? Thank you, Councillor Potter, a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Henshin. Those uh, councillors wish to speak for or against? the setting of the date for the special meeting as to the uh, adoption uh, of, um, of the annual report. Okay, those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you all. Item 8.9 is, is at 179 and is uh, the establishment of council standing committees and terms of reference. So the, uh, the Local Government Regulation 2012 gives direction and guidance on committees. It remains a matter for each local government to decide whether or not it wishes to appoint committees. Under the regulation, committees are allowed but are not mandatory. And the Local Government Act 2009 and Local Government Regulation allows councils to appoint standing committees. Now, the Chief Executive Officer is seeking direction from council on the following. The termination of council committee structure, appointment of members to the committees, and determination of the committee chairperson. Now, if you refer to uh, the second page of the agenda, uh, the report provided by uh, the uh, Chief Executive Officer uh, outlines uh, details in relation to standing committees. Uh, now, um, Mr CEO, uh, how should we appropriately proceed in terms of getting some clarity on this? Uh, all right, Mr Mayor. So, without being presumptuous with um, filling in the table, uh, the general consideration would be if we, if council, and this is where the direction of council wishes to go down this path, that it establishes um, three standing committees based on basically our departmental structure at the moment. Um, the members would be all the councils and the chair would be the mayor. Now we run that process, uh, this, this, this recommendation would be broken into two parts. So firstly, council would decide, yes, we are going to have a, have a crack at standing committees, to use a colloquialism, uh, and this would be the name and then the, the membership of them. It would then, the standing committee must have a term of reference, uh, and so the three terms of references. The highlighted sections, as I said, in the terms of references, are a lot of it is, um, uh, legislative numbering which would be administrative and would be corrected as soon as we can get our hands on a copy of the regulation. So I suspect the regulation numbers won't change but I just wanted to bring that to Council's attention that if they do change by Friday because we get a copy of, of regulations and instead of 263 it's 261, that will be done as an administrative change to reflect the regulation rather than a material change. Uh, if there is a material change, well, then it would come back. 
The, um, the second report in this sequence is then to uh, establish a, a meeting schedule. They're not like a general. You do not have to have a standing committee every month. Council determines that basically by resolution as to how they operate. So rather than writing into the terms of reference at the moment that they must meet monthly, there will be a schedule of meeting uh, schedule published at least twice a year. They are an open meeting. They carry all the same rules as a general meeting, um, procedure, standing orders. Um, they do not have a delegation to make an ultimate decision. That is still the, the providence and the, um, uh, the general meeting is the top of the pyramid. So they make a recommendation to the general. They are, as we give this, if council wishes to go down this path, they are able to be delegated the same as I carry a delegation. The one that I've seen used very uh, effectively in the past, and I've spoken to General Manager O'May about it, is planning. So you have a, as part of the community, executive and community standing committee, council may by resolution delegate that standing committee the ability to resolve planning matters. So all code accessible development, for example, may then come to that standing committee. So it's put more in the public domain, it's seen. Um, that's, that's, that's an ongoing discussion. So at the moment they've been written, written up, good English, they've been um, developed as far as a concept to see where you want to go with them that they would just make a recommendation. Now I use the, uh, the concept of a standing committee as opposed to a general is that it gives an opportunity for a very open and a little bit more unstructured debate. So rather than uh, we're in normal circumstances at uh, a general, the mayor will call for a mover and second or first and then there's a formal debate. A standing committee allows for the discussion of the matter, and I'll just pick a silly topic, but the painting of toilets. So we want to paint toilets and Kathy, uh, Councillor Duff likes pink and I like blue and Councillor Schumacher likes green and the mayor wants uh, purple. Um, it allows for that discussion and then there's a recommendation to the general, a general meeting that uh, as part of the capital works program for the 21-22 year that consideration be given to painting all toilets in the region purple because the mayor's always right. So that was a joke. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, so then the general endorses the recommendation and then that feeds into the budget process for the 21-22 year. So it allows for... Now the councillors, because there has been a lot of discussion about getting the feedback from the community and, then, and we're reviewing as part of the operational plan the community engagement and this is some of the thinking. Then if the councillors go out and Councillor Duff comes back and says, Purple, I, I, got in, I got feedback from several communities that pink's the winner. The general still has the ability. The general is still the principal meeting of the council and it must meet monthly and there is regulations and rules about the general and I'm very much a traditional about this. The general meeting is the principal guide that offers the direction and gives instruction to the organisation to act. So unless the standing committee is given a formal delegation, and this is where people sometimes get a little bit mixed up with standing committees, staff do not go out after a standing committee and paint toilets purple. What they do is they then go to the general and they feed it into a process so it becomes that whole conversation about service levels, standards, asset plans, um, a whole structure around the higher level things. If a toilet is dirty on Saturday and one of the councillors find it, that is not a topic for a standing committee. That is a customer request or there's several other processes. So again, it begins, why is the toilet dirty because the cleaners didn't turn up or someone, a bus trip came through of, of wild people and they made a mess in the loo after it was cleaned it. That's not what a standing committee is necessarily there for. It's talking about a broader um, service level or, or I'll use the word strategic, but a, a direction the council needs to go in. Now, if it gets to the general meeting and there is feedback, the same thing, is, I suppose, is finishing off the, the toilet example. The argument is generally not re-prosecuted at the general unless there is some reason to discuss it. The mayor would call for the recommendations from the community standing committee to paint all the port toilets purple. It would then, um, yep, no, we discussed that. We're all good. Purple's the winner. Feeds into the budget process and off it goes. If there is, oh, look, we got feedback and purple's really hard to buy because with COVID it's coming from China, so there is a lack of supply of purple and it'll cost us triple the amount to 
Um, so we'll fall back to our second option, which was pink. Okay, yep, General says, okay, fit it into the budget process, everything will be pink. It's, it's that, so it's probably my best advice is don't overthink it. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a flippant way. They are, and if we don't start them, so these are not things that we can just say, okay, next Wednesday we'll have a standing committee. The agenda software, there's a, there are some structural changes. And I was a little bit reluctant to, to do anything like that until I had a resolution, not because I don't want to, but I just would like to have that guidance from council as to is this really where you want to go. The other bit that we haven't done is there's been a lot of discussion internally about portfolios, is to not pull apart the portfolio structure or play with that until council is very comfortable that it understands that standing committees is what it wants. Because there's no point disbanding something before we put something new in place and then get three weeks down the track and say, oh no, this isn't what we meant. And that's again not a flippant comment, but this is, so there is still a portfolio structure for councillors, whether we then have portfolio meetings or they just then, the next tranche of this would be probably early in the new year. I've, draft, I've got drafted, um, which hasn't been circulated yet, and I've also gone to a lot of my colleagues uh, as far as um, some, some guidelines, um, pirate code type stuff, guidelines for workshops. Uh, it is actually a conversation across the industry about the unstructured meetings, and we mentioned before the legislative changes, conflict of interest once upon a time, just for media gallery and those watching. Um, because the workshop portfolio wasn't a decision-making entity, there was no implication for conflict of interest because there was an information session. Conflict of interest is now driving into those workshops. So there are changes afoot at a legislative framework to have that those things need to be a little bit more probably not thought about. Uh, there's been a lot of thought going into them in the year, but there needs to be some guidance into what is and isn't and how we deal with conflict of interest at a workshop slash portfolio gathering. So um, probably very happy to answer questions with it, Mr. Mayor. I've said to the general managers today, I, I prefer if the questions were directed at me. I have run standing committees before. I will voice my opinion, uh, and this is just my opinion because I am seeking council's direction. I quite like them. Uh, they will be telecast or live streamed. They will have minutes. Some councils over the past have chosen you used to have the ability, um, it's funny how the world goes full circle, once upon a time you didn't have the ability not to keep minutes for standing committees, then the government brought in through uh, the Local Government Act, you could choose not to keep minutes for standing committees. Now why you wouldn't keep minutes, I'm not sure, but some councils did. Now with the changes that came in on Monday, you must keep minutes for standing committees. So, um, which is, you, you would do anyway, but anyway, there are, so regrettably, as we've seen in some other the South East Queensland examples, a lot of the regulation changes have been made for those who try and think of a way around the system. You will always unfortunately get that, but the Act is pretty clear. Good governance and meeting procedure is you have your agenda, you have your minutes. So they will have a look and a feel of them about a general, but they do allow for, um, they won't have the same list of um, probably topics. They will be kept to, um, each of them their own. So the acceptable quest guidelines you have already accepted by uh, resolution. So at the infrastructure, infrastructure Standing Committee, for example, if there's an emergent planning matter, that will not be dealt with at that Standing Committee. They have to have a term of reference as to what they can and can't deal with. So they will deal with uh, matters pertaining to the infrastructure department as per the acceptable request guidelines. So rather than also, in case that was a preemptive question, why are we not having a detailed list? We've already got one. So rather than having to keep two databases and two lists, every time we change the acceptable request guidelines, it will flow through to the standing committees as to what their terms of reference are. So it's just a consolidation into, into, that, um, into that they can deal with. Other than that, yep, they're, they're a very good way. They can be closed. So a standing committee is open, uh, media, is uh, very much invited, um, same as a general. They can be closed for the same reason a general meeting is closed. Now, if there's a matter uh, that would be pre prejudicial, let's say it's one of the um, hardship clauses and publishing of a person's name uh, or details would be prejudicial because we don't want that person embarrassed by accident in the community, a standing committee can be closed for the same reason as a general. 
so they can be closed. So same structure as the general meeting agenda. You'd have your different sections. The other thing I would throw on the table to you, if you go this way, the portfolio reports that are presented at the general meeting, would they be best off being presented? And this is not a... Um, this can be dealt with as part of the agenda process, but would those portfolio reports, is, would they be best off being dealt with at the um, standing committees? Uh, if that was the case, it would give much more time for discussion on those portfolio reports and you would be able to uh, explore them in a little bit more detail, because at the moment there is generally a lot of questions and discussion now about the portfolio reports, so that would allow for a greater, de uh, not debate, but discussion about the issues that are raised in those portfolio reports, so that they would drop out of the general, and then they, but that's a, me a mechanical matter we can deal with as we go forward, but I'll just put that in your head as to would that be a better place, so then infrastructure reports uh, as talking to General Manager Meehan, I would see that the infrastructure information report that we present at um, at the portfolio meeting now, which often doesn't, um, there's bits of it end up in, the, and there's no reason that it can't end up in the public domain, that would be tabled as part of the portfolio report for that meeting. And so that document would then be put into the public domain. So it, it allows that more visibility and more flexibility. There are a lot of very complex things that we deal with that, we don't get, um, and I'll use the infrastructure again, the resealing program. It's a great thing. Council is now actively involved in resealing. Uh, we're doing a lot of preemptive maintenance in the resealing section. The works department, infrastructure department, doing really good things. We are a criticism uh, as well as a lot of the questions. Why are we doing that road? It's not broken. Why aren't you fixing my road? Because my road's broken. The purpose of the bitumen on top of the road is to protect the gravel and the subpavement underneath. So the reason that we're doing a reseal on a, on a road is to stop the water getting in underneath the damaging the road to make it broken. So it's preemptive maintenance. Now, sometimes the community isn't used to seeing us do preemptive maintenance. So a standing committee, again, when those discussions come up, gives a lot more ability at a general meeting. Quite often those sorts of programs are part, and we've talked about in the budget. They're a single line. They, they don't get an airing. So it allows for that program um, to give an example to be explained as to, okay, this is the why, why, why we're doing it. And um, if you're within council or you have some familiarity with what we do, sometimes that's understood. But a lot of time in the broader community, it's difficult to have that discussion. One-on-one, -on -one you can have it very easily, but get it out on a broader. That's what a standing committee is meant to do. So happy to take questions, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, Mr. CEO. In response to your um, very good, and thank you very much, very comprehensive explanation as to standing committees um, and their um, application, uh, I would now uh, move that Council adopt the following standing committee structure in terms of reference as attached to the report for each of these standing committees pursuant to section 264 of the Local Government Regulation 2012, standing committees to include uh, infrastructure, executive and community, finance and corporate, that the members of the standing committees are the seven councillors, including the mayor, of course, and that the chair of each standing committee uh, is to be the mayor. And of course, in the mayor's absence, that would fall back to the deputy mayor. Uh, council adopt the following terms of reference. Infrastructure Standing Committee, Executive and Community Standing Committee, Finance and Corporate Standing Committee, and that portfolio reports are presented at the relevant Standing Committee. Do we have a second of a such? Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. Right, well, the motion is now on the table. I'll now open the floor to uh, those who wish to speak for or against, or as Mr. CEO has indicated, I'm sure he's happy to take questions should you require clarification. Councillor Potter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have to say that this, when, we, when this first came um, to us as an option, I was actually quite concerned, but since then I've spoken to other councillors um, from a few different areas, and I do believe that this is now going to be the way of the future. And I also believe that this is better for the community because it, it'll make us more transparent and open to them. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Councillor Schumacher. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, 
I just want to second Councillor Potter's comments. I'm actually completely supportive of this approach. I think it enables, it actually empowers this council to have more robust discussions in the public arena and it allows our community and the public to, to see that, um, to see the discussions in which and the, the work that goes in behind the scenes to what's actually brought to a general meeting. And I think at the moment it's fair to say that there, that isn't always understood. I certainly agree with some of um, CEO Mark's comments in that regard. I think this is really about opening up the doors. It's about having more deeper conversations and looking um, at some of these things strategically in, in the public eye. So I'm fully supportive of this approach. I think it uh, aligns with good governance. It aligns with ethical, accountable and transparent decision making. And of course, as a councillor, I'm um, fully committed to that. So I'm fully supportive of um, introducing standing committees and thank you for bringing it to council. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to also endorse um, what's been said. I absolutely agree. I think that this is um, a fantastic uh, day for Council. I think it's, it, it means that now we can... Um, uh, the community can hear the debate that co goes on behind um, the closed doors in, in many instances. It's not so much a debate, but it's, it's, it's the discussion, the background. And with um, some of the big decisions, we appear and we have over a long period of time as if we've just rubber stamped them at the council meetings, but that's not the case. But it's, I'd like to see this as a way, as has been already suggested, to take the community with us on the decision so that um, part of that whole process is about how do we arrive at, at that outcome and that you can understand because until you hear the background, you, you just it's really, really hard to understand why sometimes we make certain decisions. So I'm really excited about this um, option and I'm really looking forward to um, progressing it as, as a, to be a way forward with a more open and transparent council. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Uh, does any other councillor wish to speak for or against the motion? Uh, if not, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, as uh, the mover of the motion. Uh, in first of all, acknowledging the body of work that has been undertaken by our CEO uh, at a very, very busy time of the year. Um, this is not a, uh, a matter to be taken lightly. It's a significant reform for our council uh, as we move into a new era that is um, seeing uh, increasing, uh, increasingly legislation and regulation that is expecting councils to be much more open and transparent with the uh, way in which we make decisions and keep the community informed. Uh, and our CEO has done a lot of work uh, to make sure that what's brought to this council meeting today, in terms of particularly the terms of reference around this, each of these committees is going to be robust and efficient and effective for us moving forward as a council. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge our CEO and I'd like that to be recorded in the minutes if we could, because it is uh, certainly a challenging space, but again, uh, our council is probably leading the way in Queensland in terms of the implementation of these reforms, once again uh, demonstrating our commitment to being a model council in the implementation of the rolling reforms of the government in relation to Belcara. Uh, these are significant reforms. Uh, the unstructured portfolio briefings under the new legislation uh, do put council at risk, I believe, in relation to uh, conflict of interest and in relation to perhaps taking decisions or being perceived to take decisions outside of an appropriate decision-making forum. Um, the new Integrity Act um, certainly makes it uh, much, puts in place much more stringent requirements in relation to registers of interest, conflicts of interest, and open and tra transparent uh, decision-making. This will, of course, um, mean that uh, discussions that perhaps were previously had in portfolio briefings would uh, now be not always, but to a large extent, uh, held within standing committees. The opportunity to debate matters prior to prior to resolutions being put on the table uh, gives us that flexibility. It means that these will be uh, these matters will now be open to the community for public viewing, open to the media, and uh, a commitment that we made, uh, that I certainly made uh, over over recent months, um, in response to a, I think a strong degree of of, um, of of expectation from the community was that our council. Uh, would open up um, the, you know, and be much more transparent in the way in which we make decisions. And I think that's good for council in that we people will now have the information and a better understanding as your CEO has articulated in relation to why certain decisions are made. 
The other thing, of course, is that um, it will uh, enable us to ensure, as I, as I said before, that our council remains compliant uh, with legislation moving forward. So, now we'll now put the, the matter to, a, to the vote. Uh, all those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, we've got one more item uh, before we um, move into portfolio reports, which is item 8.2. 10. Uh, we'll deal with that matter and then we'll break for morning tea. It's at 1.93 and uh, the matter is meeting dates for the ordinary meetings of council's standing committees and general meetings and uh, this report is to recommend dates, times and locations for ordinary meetings of council's standing committees and general meetings for the period 1 November to 31 December 2020, should council, well, council has now adopted uh, standing committees by resolution. If you go to the second page of the agenda item, you can see there where uh, the officer has provided uh, a list of meetings, the dates, times, and locations for such uh, from now until 31 December. And the, the officer's recommendation is that uh, those dates, times and locations for ordinary meetings of council, standing committees and general meetings are as stated. Do we have a mover for such? Thank you, Councillor Duff. A seconder, thank you, Councillor Potter. Does any councillor wish to speak for or against the motion? All in favour? Those in favour, sorry. Resolution passed unanimously. <laughs> thank you all. Mr Mayor, there would be a subsequent report to the December general setting the meeting dates for the new year. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Mr. CEO. So that'll take us through to the end of December, uh, and then we'll we'll revisit uh, next calendar year's dates after that. Right. Well, it's been a productive uh, morning. Thank you. We'll. Uh, I would now. Um, okay, everybody. Uh, now move that uh, we reopen the uh, the meeting. Have a seconder. Thanks, Councillor Potter. Uh, meeting reopened at uh, ten fifty four a.m. Item 9.1 on the agenda is at 195, and it's the Roads and Drainage Portfolio Report, and uh, I'll now hand it over to Councillor Jones to deliver such. Thanks, Councillor Jones. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And uh, again, great pleasure to uh, deliver some good news uh, for the Roads and Drainage uh, Portfolio Report for the month of October. We'll go straight into our capital works. We have a bitumen reseal program about to uh, get, uh, we've got a tender currently underway, uh, the resealing 40-odd uh, roads for the uh, year of 2021. Uh, the Bunya Mountains car park upgrade, the reinstatement of Bunya Avenue pedestrian access upgrade of current footpath and car park. That project is uh, due to commence this month and uh, the people of the uh, Bunya Mountains community organisation up there are really looking forward to that and I guess all the people that... Uh, make their way to the top of the mountain, one of our hot tourist spots in the uh, southeast corner. I'm sure they'll really appreciate the work that we're about to undergo up there. Dingo Creek Car Park in Wandai. We were over in Wandai, Mergen yesterday. I see all the uh, security fences up in place and uh, that's due to uh, upgrade the car park to Bitumen Seal standard there. That's in front of the little um, park opposite the uh, sports ground golf, golf course, that area. Uh, Hood Street, Proston, curb and channel upgrade, that also uh, end of October through November. The Cumbia footpath upgrade, construction of new footpath from Cumbia State School to Francis Street, that's also due to start uh, this month and that will be a, uh, an added bonus, uh, keeping in mind that uh, we have Cumbia, the main street of Cumbia, coming up as a, uh, an upgrade through there and uh, to beautify the town through there, so uh, that'll work in well with that works. The Mergen CBD footpath upgrade, Lamb Street, Mergen. Uh, that project is continuing with demolition work commencing on stage three. Uh, we were there yesterday for our uh, council catch up and we uh, witnessed the works going on up there. Uh, we walked down the uh, centre of the CBD of Mergen and uh, people were coming out of their businesses and congratulating council and just making sure that we knew how appreciative that the people of Mergen were for the work that's been done in the CBD. So congratulations to everyone involved in that one. Niagara Road at Boyneside, the rehabilitation of existing seal, drainage construction and flood damage repairs. 
that uh, project is currently underway and has been uh, for the last couple of months. That will be a massive boost to that area out there. And uh, when we finish those uh, roadworks, that's been an ongoing process ever since the wind farm, AGL and uh, the likes were out there. A lot of negotiating and uh, a good outcome for the region. <clears throat> Youngman Street, Kingaroy, minor curb and uh, channel replacement between Avoca Street and Markwell Street. And that project is also due to commence in the month of October. Uh, our gravel resheeting and heavy formation grades, we're going to Deep Creek Road. There'll be some shoulder repairs through, uh, through October. The Maidenwell Upper Yarraman Road, the gravel resheeting, that's currently underway. Mundubra Jurong Road, shoulder, re, uh, shoulder grading, that work is currently taking place and should make a significant difference to that uh, narrow piece of bitumen that we keep lobbying the state and federal government to try and continue uh, the completion of the last 11 k's of uh, narrow bitumen in our area before we go into the North Burnett. Old Yarraman Road, gravel resheeting through October, Reedy Creek Road. Now that's a good one that uh, we've been uh, getting some phone calls on and I'm happy to say that that will uh, receive some gravel resheet work through October, November. Ryan Regan Road, gravel resheeting also, that ties in with uh, the Maidenwell Upper Yarraman Road. Silverleaf Road, reseal, prep, heavy shoulder grading and gravel patching. Uh, that will make a difference there. We were out there with uh, Councillor Henshin and Councillor Shoemaker. We drove that road and there was some work getting done along there. Tarong Yarraman Road also coincides with uh, Ryan Regan and Maidenwell Upper Yarraman Road. West Rurulan Road also will get gravel resheeting. Our pro patrol grading out at Belogi, Lewis Duff Road, Blackbutt South, we have Ogilvy Road, Chapinga, Garden Creek Road, Freshwater Road, Charlestown, uh, Bessons Road, <coughs> excuse me, Crawford. Zolner, Champneys and Irwins Road, Jurong, Coven, McLean, McPhee, Ridge and Iron Bark Road, Goodja, Benin, Ellesmere Road. Now that will uh, obviously address hopefully some of that uh, shoulder work as well along the narrow bitumen. I don't know that that includes that, but I'm sure the other end of uh, Benin, Ellesmere is uh, in need of some work there. We were out there not long ago at a uh, ag meeting and uh, there was some work getting done around there. Gordon Brook, we have Weens, Wicks, Slattery, Holtz, Poynton's, Linns, Cooleys, Carews, Findowie and Trouts Road, all getting patrol grading there. Kingaroy, we have Railway Road and Lankowski's Road, Memorambi, Lampards Road, Wenzel's Road and Crittenden Road. Roadside slashing and boom mowing, we go to Crownthorpe, Blackburn, Smiths, Uptons and Pringles Hill Road, Mannion, Mergen and Tablelands, all the roads through there will uh, receive some attention. Our storm damage, work is currently underway with both council crews and contractors engaged in repairing road damage resulting from the February 2020 storm. Roads being completed during October, November are Gerrards Road, Kinley Moore School Road, McLucas Road, Niagara Road, Pedersons Road, Shelley Top Road, Underwoods and Walkers Road. Our completed works for September through our Capital Works Program, Alford Street Car Park in Kingaroy, the rehabilitation of the car park. We were up there the other day getting photos and, uh, and uh, the like to promote that good news story. The crews have done a wonderful job and I think it's been well received from the community by what feedback I'm getting. So uh, congratulations to those people. Gravel resheeting and heavy formation grade. Uh, completed were Burrabri Road, Frybergs Road, Glenmore Road, Harsh Road and Memorambi Gordonbrook Road through a medium formation grade. I'll just make mention um, Memorambi Gordonbrook. We have had some feedback back there that uh, that works has been completed not that long ago and people aren't happy with it and uh, I've since addressed it with our staff and uh, it has been acknowledged and that works will be coming back trying to get back into our works program hopefully before Christmas, but maybe just after Christmas. So Memorami Gordonbrook. So that's just a, a little point of view, just to say that we're not saying that we're perfect, but we're getting better and better everywhere we go. Bitumen reseal preparation. All right, this is uh, reseal prep. People will see the graders and out there doing work and then they'll start complaining because we haven't finished the job and all that. It is reseal preparation work for the reseal program. So we have Kinley Moore School Road, McAllister's, MP Creek, Silverleaf, Vidello, uh, Vidello Drive and Waterview Drive. Almost to the end. We have patrol grading that has been done in Belogi, Banarkin North, Blackbutt, Blackbutt South, 
Charleston, Jurong, Goodja, Inverloor, Kingaroy, Mamarambi, Naku, Taromeo, Tila and Wattle Camp. So again, you can see that uh, our staff are spreading services right across the region, not just in one particular area, but everyone that pays rates is getting a service somewhere along the line. And it's like a race, everyone has a winner and sometimes you last. So it's just a matter of time, but the, uh, our works program that is in place is continuing to work. Roadside slashing and boom mowing, we have Brooklands, East Nanango, Hodgley, Nanango and Tarong. And again, uh, the crews are working through. And again, Mr Mayor, I would like to offer a big congratulations to all our staff, both internally and externally, the men and women that do the job that we get the recognition for. They're doing a wonderful job and they continue to improve. And again, I won't say we're perfect, but we are getting better and better everywhere we go. And the process has been in, in place for about two years, two and a half years, with an expected 18 month uh, completion on the program we started that two years ago and uh, expecting good results for the remainder of this year and into the future. So thank you. And I'd just like to move that my portfolio for roads and drainage for the month of October be accepted. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Jones. We have a seconder. Yep, thanks, Councillor Henshin. Right, uh, just uh, I'd like to certainly uh, make a couple of um, comments and questions there. First of all, uh, bitumen reel resealing. Um, Councillor Jones, good to see that there's 40 roads being done in the current year in terms of the bitumen resealing program. Uh, good, to, uh, good to note, Cumbia Main Street, the footpath being done there from the school for school students uh, walking along that footpath and that there's going to be uh, further work undertaken by council in, uh, in uh, redeveloping uh, the main township of Cumbia in terms of the facilities there in the current financial year. So to the Cumbia people, that'll be a, a really good development. I know Councillor henshin has been uh, working on that one. And uh, the Mergen CBD. Just want to recognise uh, Councillor, Councillor Jones, Councillor Duff, your contribution uh, over the last few years to bringing that to reality along with uh, General Manager Me. And uh, I've certainly had a lot of positive feedback from the people of Mergen in terms of not only the fact that Council's committed to the project, but also the way in which it's been done uh, by both yourself, Councillor Jones. I know you were instrumental in making that happen. And I'd like to acknowledge you in relation to that and with the support of Councillor Duff. And of course, the other thing is to announce uh, support is to uh, is to acknowledge the Queensland government through their um, through their funding programs in supporting council in jointly funding that. Uh, in terms of the um, the the um, the Mundubra Jurong Road, of course, Councillor Jones has uh, mentioned that that's a very important freight route uh, for Southern Queensland rural transport. Uh, there is another 11 kilometre section that does need to be completed. Councillor Jones, I know, has been working on this for some time, as have the working group and Councillor Duff. Um, this evening uh, and tomorrow evening at five and six o'clock, Council will be holding forums uh, with local candidates for the seat of the Nango, five o'clock today and five o'clock tomorrow. We've got four candidates coming in and one of the matters that we've advocated for through our action plan, our advocacy action plan, and we'll be putting that on the agenda this evening and tomorrow evening with the state candidates is uh, the completion, uh, seeking funding for the completion of that Mundubra Jurong Road as a very, very important economic enabler for our region. And good to see that the highway slashing is also happening. Uh, just one question for General Manager. Uh, highway slashing, um, I've noted that as I travel around uh, the various regional council areas, I'd just like to acknowledge the work that's being done on highway slashing. Uh, it seems to me, um, as someone that probably doesn't know a lot about it, but our highways just seem to be a lot more tidy and neat in terms of our slashing than, with all due respect, to some other regional council areas. As you're moving in and out of our region, I think we're doing a really good job in our highway slashing. It's been a much improved effort there, General Manager Me, and uh, I imagine we'll be doing the Mergen to Kingaroy stretch again at some stage in the future um, as part of our ongoing program. So, yeah, good. Well, that was uh, my views on that. I just wanted to see if any other council wanted to make any comment in relation to that. Thanks, Councillor Duff. Um, yes, Mr Mayor, I, I wanted to acknowledge um, the work that's been done in the Mergen footpath and what I particularly was pleased about uh, yesterday when we had the councillor catch, catch up and um, just the fact that we went, I, I went into um, some of the businesses and they're actually going to upgrade their businesses because all the front part of their businesses because we've done the work and they've said, council put the money in so we want to do something too. So there's two of the hotels are both going to upgrade the whole front of their buildings and this is just such, it's such a good news story. And the other one, I just wanted to say that the Hood Street um, curb and channeling, when my brother was elected in, in um, uh, 
he was elected in, in the year 2000 and he, um, his first project was to get curb and channeling done in Hood Street. And um, it's a bit of a funny story because he put it on the works program and then I got elected in 2004 and then it got done. And they said it t takes a woman to get it done. And it was a week, I'd only been a councillor for a month and it, it got done, but it had finally reached, back in Wondi days, it took that long to get to the pro, the, to be the pro, on the program of work, so four years. And I felt so sorry for him because he, he tried for it and now I've got another piece of Hood Street getting done. <laughs> so, and that's like so many years later, so it's a bit of a, a, a good news story with that, with that Hood Street because that drainage there has been a real... Uh, bugbear for a very long time. It causes a lot of erosion. It's a safety issue, so I'm really pleased that that job's getting done. But yeah, just overall, really excited about what's happening with the works program and what um, Councillor Jones said about it happening right across the region. The grading going right, right out everywhere and the reseal, so it's very, very good. So congratulations to General Manager Meehan and your team. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Duff. Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Jones, for your comprehensive report. Um, my only question was just about clarifying what work's being done to the Bunya Mountains car park um, in the upgrade. If, if I can, a question through you. Yeah, Mr. certainly, Mayor. Councillor Schumacher, uh, General Manager. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, it's a combined capital project, and I think it's the Drought Communities Program I think we've funded through as well. So as you go down uh, Bunya Avenue on the left-hand side, the walkway is currently covered um, with leaves and vegetation. So we're going to clear that back. We also correct the walkway on the left-hand side. So at the moment, we have a what is a, a, a probably a, a road safety issue, which is a, a, a concern with um, vehicles and pedestrians that mix along Bunya Avenue. So we're looking to um, put a... a a coloured asphalt or coloured bitumen on the left hand side. Um, there's a white line there at the moment, we are going to delineate it better. Um, we'll also be um, where the drain is just up from the cafe, there's a large dip drain there where the horse and carriage goes to. We're actually going to widen that out and put a car park there as well, So, which will then put a, a proper constructed um, footpath up against the fence line, So, which is it delineates pedestrians and, and cars through there as well. So the idea is that we'll tidy up that entire left-hand side. Won't fix all the issues, but it'll be a great improvement for there, particularly um, as it gets busier and busier. And we expect that, you know, obviously coming into the warmer months that, that will pick up as well. So, um, so yeah, so it'd be great safety improvements up there and also probably just reduces the maintenance. A lot of times we've had issues where people get bogged up there when it's wet in the drain as well um, and trying to get them out. So um, we'll be doing that. The other thing is we'll be installing, um, we talk about inclusiveness as well, we will be installing some um, disabled car parks as well, particularly uh, closer to the established facilities there as well to uh, make sure that those, those facilities are available for those members of our community. Right, good, yeah, thanks General Manager and um, yeah, Councillor Schumacher. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you for the update. That's great. Yeah, of course, and of course uh, it's important to acknowledge uh, the Federal Government in supporting uh, Council with the Drought Communities Program. Tremendous funding we've received from the Australian Government to enable us to do projects such as that which create employment in our region and allow our region's area to develop uh, the Bunya Mountains as, of course, is an important asset for the community and uh, that work is only going to enhance the value of that asset. Thank you to the Australian Government. Okay, uh, Councillor Jones. Yeah, just a quick one, Mr Mayor. I just want to acknowledge uh, Councillor Duff's comment there in regards to the Mergen business and uh, uh, certainly taking on board and acknowledging the amount of money that was spent in Mergen. Uh, when we first started Mergen, uh, we had a budget and that budget has blown out considerably, but it's money well spent and uh, I expect that the same process will go through the KTP and also through Cumbia, Blackbutt and Wandai and the Nanga and the remainder of the, uh, the South Burnet. But uh, in, that, uh, in the budget blowout, Council managed to uh, secure the funds to make sure that that project has been completed and been a success. So it's very good to hear that the businesses in Mergen have appreciated the money and the effort of Council to improve their business and take advantage of the money that's been spent right outside their door. So I, uh, as again, being now part of the KTP project, I would expect that the same thing will happen after we finish this project in the, in the uh, coming years. So, Yeah, thanks Councillor Jones. It's important uh, that um, the community also, uh, knowledge for the community that and the media that uh, this is a rolling um, process with Council. We are 
uh, very much committed to an ongoing program of redeveloping the CBD areas throughout every community in the entire region. Uh, so this year we've committed funding to Blackbutt. Uh, there will be further work then undertaken um, in Wandai. We have committed to Cumbia. Um, and then we'll move through the Nango. And I know our general manager, Megan, has certainly got a uh, program that he's working on with his staff to make sure that over this term of council, uh, we do as much as we can in terms of working through those CBD redevelopments as Councillor Jones has highlighted. And again, important to acknowledge uh, the $3.3 million we did get from the current Queensland Government um, for the uh, Works for Queensland COVID funding was much more than we expected and it's enabled us to do projects like this, including stage three of the Mergen footpath, I believe, General Manager. Uh, so uh, $3.3 million was a fair old chunk of money that came into our region. Uh, I think we got more than a lot of the South East Councils actually, uh, so that was great to see. Um, so again, acknowledge the State, acknowledge the state Government, uh, the Minister and also uh, Council and the staff for the work that we've done there. It's been a very, very good cooperative effort from all parties involved. Okay, well, uh, if there's no further comments in relation to Council Jones' very comprehensive report, uh, then uh, we'll, uh, we'll put that to the vote that it be accepted. Uh, those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you all and thank you, Councillor Jones. Okay, we'll now move on to uh, item 9.2 on the agenda, which can be found at 196. And the matter is the, an application for permanent road closure at the corner of Elwoods Road and Mamorambi Gordonbrook Road, Gordonbrook, uh, in relation to Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. An application for the permanent road closure at the corner of Elwoods and Memorambi Gordonbrook Road has been received and the section of road is to be utilised by the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services for a proposed rural fire brigade station. Council has no current or future use for this section of road reserve and the officer's recommendation is that council offers no objections to the permanent part road closure at the corner of Elwoods Road and Memorambi Gordonbrook Road, Gordonbrook. Uh, do we have a mover for such? Thank you, Councillor Potter, and a seconder. Thank you very much, Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, does any councillor wish to speak for or against the motion? Those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you all. Item 9.3 at 200. It's a request to, uh, to name an existing constructed unnamed road reserve that intersects with Gore Street in the Mergen locality. And the request has been received to name the existing constructed road reserve that intersects with Gore Street. Uh, the name of Cherry Lane is proposed on community suggestion. Officer's recommendation that council names the existing constructed unnamed road reserve that intersects with Gore Street, Mergen to Cherry Lane, Mergen, do we have a mover for such? Thank you, Councillor Froloff, and a seconder. Thanks, Councillor Potter. And does any councillor wish to speak for or against? <laughs> councillor Duff? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, yes, Mr Mayor, I just wanted to say that I think that this is a, a, a great outcome. It's just a nice name because um, the, the community feedback was that um, Cherry, Cherry Buses and Coaches was a business that, that operated years ago and um, now purses have that purses transport have that that so i think it's just nice to recognize the the um the, the history of mergen with that with that particular business and to call it that um street cherry lane thank you mr mayor thank you councillor duff those in favor resolution passed unanimously thank you all moving on to item 10.1 at 203 and that is the uh, portfolio report for community arts, heritage, sport and recreation. It's my pleasure to hand over to Councillor Potter pr to present such. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, we'll start with the community. So we'll start with the community grants, um, grants program. I am pleased to announce that Council has Council received 35 applications for round one of the community grants program. The Community Grants Assessment Panel, comprising of myself and my fellow councillors, Jones, Froloff, Shoemaker, Duff and Henshin, we met recently to discuss and evaluate the applications. And I'm very pleased to announce the following successful applications. Um, for Community Hall Insurance, we've got the Tablelands, Cumbia, Inverloor, Wurulan and Mondial Halls. Um, for Activity for Australia Day events, we've got um, Nanango Tourism and Development Association, and we've got the Cumbian District Memorial School, um, School of the Arts. 
um, for $1,000 each. Um, for more activities, we've got the Nanango Family Christmas Carnival by NATDA. We've got the South Burnett Gem Show. Um, we've got King, um, the Melbourne Cup for the Cumbia Cup Day races, the Duma Dam Yellow Belly Family Fishing Comp and the Cumbia Christmas Carnival. Um, we've got the Black Butt State School Recycling Depot. That, I think, is an amazing project that Black Butt School has taken initiative on, I might add. Um, the Go-Getter Girls for support of the Dead Cow Gully, Gully Ultra. Um, tools for the wood um, tooling and woodworking for the Kingaroy Men's Shed. Um, the Nanango History Room. We've got the QCWA Black Butt Yarraman Branch. The Cumbia Tennis Association. The Mergen RSL Branch. The Nango RSL Branch. Black Butt and District Tourism Association. Queensland Dairy and Heritage Museum. And the Wandai API Society, which is the the show society. Um, we've also got the South Burnett um, Rugby Leagues, which is their Beyond the Nest Development Camp. We've got the Nanango Tai Chi, the little South Burnett Little Athletics um, for their high jump area. We've got S we've got also the school ones. We've got the Kingroy State High School for 500, and we've got the Wandai State School for 300. I sh sorry, I should have said the Kingroy State High School. 500. Now, this is the one of the best parts. It was quite a bit of excitement this morning when we actually found it on their website. Um, I'd like to make particular mention to the funding offered under the Regional Arts Development Program. Um, this program of funding is a partnership between Council and Arts Queensland, whereby each year Council applies for Arts Queensland for a 60 contribution to the program and I am very pleased to be able to announce that Council has been successful in our bid having asked for additional support for finance this year. So we've, um, with the RADA fund we've got 5000 to develop for development of a regional arts policy. We've got 16645 for funding for the arts community through the RADA program and we've got 11288 which is a co-investment through the Regional Arts Development Fund between South Burnett, Fraser Coast and Bundaberg Regional Councils. And with this, this round of successful RADF applications, we have the Nanango Playfest 2021 for the Nanango Theatre Company of $3,000. And we've got a filmmaking workshop um, incursions with Mergen State High School run by the Noosa Film Festival for $3,000. Now, if anyone has any queries relating to the Community Grants Program, I encourage them to contact Council and discuss their activity project or event. I might add here that we really would love to get an array of pictures, photographs, movies from any, all of these activities so we can actually start putting them up on, putting them up on the Council page and even having um, at the front council chamber so people can actually see what council has helped fund. So um, if anyone is involved with any of these groups, um, I'd really like them to take that on board because the more we can show the community what's out there, the more people might be interested in those programs. With the libraries, we've got the Kingdom li Library with the South Burnett Libraries, which is the Children's Loyalty Program, which launched just in time for the school holidays. I did touch on this in the last council meeting because it started on the 21st of September. And we had close to 100 children access across the region that have registered for the new children's loyalty program, Kingdom of Libraria. And in the early stages of creating this new program, library staff were set the task of creating something unique that would capture the imagination of the young community members and encourage them to visit our library and get to know the staff and the resources that are actually available to them. And based on a magical kingdom of six houses, Butchutopia, Nanagoria, Kingsmore, Wanhaven, Murloc and Prostonia, I guess you never know where they came from, which is actually based on the townships of Blackbutt, Nanango, Kingaroy, Wandai, Mergen and Proston. The children are transported. You, could, you didn't get that at all. So the children are transported in a magical world of whimsical characters, many mini missions and bonus activities via their Kingdom of Libraria passports. Although there is no need, that no need to physically visit each of the libraries to complete the program, bonus prizes are available for those who wish to explore the South Burnett region. The Kingdom of Libraria will run for at least a year, providing children plenty of time to enjoy this magical new program. 
South Burnett Libraries Tech Savvy Grant. In February 2020, the South Burnett Libraries were successful in obtaining the State Library of Queensland um, Tech Savvy Seniors Queensland Grant of $9,056. These funds were sought to purchase a suite of new laptops and tablets to be used in a series of outreach sessions hosted by library staff at local aged care facilities with a portion of the funds earmarking for earmarked for staff training. Although COVID-19 delayed the launch of the outreach sessions, library staff continue to work with Council's workplace health and safety team to ensure these sessions take place when it is safe to do so in our region. Funds from the grant have thus far been allocated to purchase three laptops and three tablets. And the grant, um, the grant funds have also provided library staff with a chance to attend the Be Connected Digital Mentor Online Train the Trainer program comprising of eight modules. And library staff have been able to work through the course at their own pace, building the skills, knowledge, and the confidence necessary to deliver digital literacy programs and initiatives in the community. The Be Connected program is an Australian government initiative committed to increasing the confidence, skills, and online safety of older Australians. Creepy Critters, the South Bennett Library's Creepy Critters craft packs have been very popular with over 200 bundles handed out to young library pat patrons across the region during the September school holidays. Check out the South Burnett Library's Facebook page to see some of the wonderful creations posted by our local families. The First Five Forever. And using funds secured via a $3,000 First Five Forever Innovation Micro Grant, South Burnett Libraries will celebrate Children's Book Week by visiting a number of schools across the region from the 16th to the 23rd of October 2020. Library staff will deliver a series of outreach sessions featuring a transportable puppet theatre tailor made by the Kingaroo Men's Shed at schools including Tabinga, Warulan, Cloyna, Wondai, Moffatdale, Mergen and Coolabunya, while supporting the key messages of the First Five Forever initiative. It is hoped that the use of the puppets and imaginative play will encourage children to view their local library as a fun and exciting place to visit. And I must thank our library staff on this note because they have been, throughout this whole COVID issue, they have absolutely been fantastic. The way they've upgraded, they've changed to, to bring these sessions to the public and to the children of our area. Sport and Rec. Um, Touch football, the seniors um, regional competitions coming up, in, um, coming up in October. The club is still hosting club competitions, competition nights every week under the NRL and touch strict COVID rules. From the 1st to the 3rd of October this year, the National Youth Touch Competition was held at the Sunshine Coast, played at the Sunshine Coast Stadium grounds. The Sunshine Coast side is made up of elite young touch players from the South Burnett, North Burnett, Harvey Bay, Gympie, Sunshine Coast and Caboolture regions. The Kingaroy Touch had nine children selected into the Sunshine Coast sides after selection trials and a number of trips to the, to the Sunshine Coast for training sessions. These children are Sienna Taylor and Callie Trace for under 12 girls, Jasper Corson, under 12 boys, Shane White, for Shani White, under 14 girls, Josh Freeman and Rory Crumpton, under 14 boys, Kaylee Collins, under 16 girls, Lachlan Zelensky and Andre Waltman, under 16 boys. And it's really great that we've got those, that wonderful talent in the South Burnett for that. The Kingroy Athletic season started in September and the club has, has hosted an ITC coaching course this season already. The South Burnett AFL season is finished for another year and it was a very different season to normal with COVID-19 ruling and the changes of the season layout. The Nanango Football Club has had the Alan Downey renaming signed off by council for the clubhouse and the Bram Soccer Club will host the Summer Sevens competitions this October. South Burnett Cricket um, at local level will begin the second week in October and senior teams have begun in the Gibby competition in September. The only change this season will be the COVID regulations around the umpires more than the players. Um, combined Sports, the Kingaroo Combined sports is, sports is having their third meeting this season. Council Sport and Recreation Officer will attend the meeting in October as an advisor only. The Kingaroo Touch Cricket and Soccer 
The Kingaroy Touch Cricket and Soccer have now become an associated group housed at the Kingaroy Soccer Fields and are hiring Council's Town Common Hall to host all meetings. Council's Recreation Services Coordinator is meeting with the State Sports Advisor in October to discuss the infrastructure and relaunch of what should hold out for the Wondai Precinct submission. And also, um, on another note, the State Government funding was announced with just under 178000 um, of funding hitting our local region sports club. We only had four clubs that missed out, but um, we are working with the clubs that missed out on the community funding applications. So there's a list there. I'm not going to read them all out, um, but there's, it's just fantastic that we've had somewhere between the two, um, 2,461 right up to the 16,000 for some of the $16,027 for some of the clubs. So as I said, which is a total of $177,739 from the state government for our local sporting clubs, which is absolutely fantastic. So Mr Mayor, I'd like to move that my report be accepted to council, thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor Potter. Do we have a second for such? Thank you, Councillor um, Shoemaker. And uh, it's an excellent report, isn't it? Very uplifting to hear about so many wonderful projects. Uh, our library staff just continue to kick goals. Absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, what a tremendous list of, of, um, of community grants allocated by the councillors uh, and the staff this year again. I um, just had a question in relation to the $5,000 for the development of a regional arts policy coming through RADIF. Will there be some flexibility, do you think, in relation to how that money is utilised? Could it perhaps be also utilised from strategic planning with, um, with arts across the region? Um, Mr Mayor, I'd probably have to forward that question through to um, either the CEO or through to GM... I may. Yeah, thanks, Cats. I'm um, happy to take that on notice. We can have a look at that another time, I'm sure, uh, but just to flag that one. But that's uh, tremendous news. The other ones, of course, I uh, just want to make note of is that um, uh, great to see that our sporting clubs across the region have received uh, $178,000 in funding from the Queensland Government. Um, there's some really, really great projects in there. Um, I'm really pleased, for example, to see the Black Butt uh, football field being resurfaced. I know it's been a um, great to see that the club down there have continued to, um, continued to endure difficult times uh, for a small community. They do a great job. Wonderful to see that that's been acknowledged along with all the other community groups uh, in sport across our region. There's a, that's a, a great injection into our sporting. So we'd like again on behalf of council to pass on our congratulations to them and our acknowledgement and thanks to the Queensland Government for again supporting our region. Okay, well, well done. Uh, Councillor Jones. Yeah, Mr Mayor, thank you. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, Councillor Potter acknowledged the uh, South Burnett uh, AFL, and I believe that we have our uh, men and women's best and fairest players here for our uh, AFL side. Uh, so I'd like to pass on a congratulations to our two reporters, Laura and Tristan. So congratulations to you, Kev. Well, it was wonderful. We went down and uh, actually... Uh, took in a game of footy down here at the uh, local sports ground and both sides won that particular day. It was great. It was a great afternoon, great day. So uh, congratulations to you two and your teams and wish you all the best. Uh, with the funding, Councillor Potter, the, you can clarify this for me, um, Australia Day funding, we have two uh, successful applicants, but uh, for people out there that uh, participate and run events on behalf of Council, that funding will still be available. Uh, I'd just to make sure, and also the filmmaking that uh, I'm happy to support, but I did have concerns when we met that uh, I see it's uh, it Mergen again, and I raised the question, I would like to see it um, passed across the South Burnett region. Uh, is there any feedback on that, whether whether uh, where they've come to, or I guess you can take that on notice and get back to me on that one, please? Yes, Oh, sorry. With regards to the RADA funding, yes, um, Councillor Jones, I will have to take that on notice. Um, now, what was the first question, sorry? The Day. Oh, the Australia Day funding. I know we did discuss that during the meeting, but that's something I think will have to involve a policy change, if I'm correct, Mr CEO. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Potter. I'm sure CEO will take that on notice. Right, well, uh, okay, that being the case, uh, all those in favour of acceptance of the report, Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, Councillor Potter. 
We'll move now on to item 11.1 .1 at 204, which is the Rural Services, Natural Resource Management, Planning and Compliance Services Portfolio Report. It's my pleasure to uh, um, hand over to uh, Councillor Henshin to present such. Thanks, Councillor Henshin. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'd like to present my past month's report for our Natural Resource Management, Planning, Compliance and uh, Natural Resources and Rural Services, of course. In our Rural Services and Natural Resource Management, Weed control, pest management contractors and staff treated 1.7 hectares of restricted weeds in August, including Mother of Millions, treatment on the council roads and reserves in the Baie, Bundumba, Wandai, Tengura, Kushni, Coolabunya, Bowie, Brooklands, Maidenwell and Gordonbrook areas. And property inspections were completed in the Waddle Camp, Wilkesdale and Wengenville areas. Hudson Pear inspections in the Wilkesdale area in conduction with Biosecurity Queensland and Council's spray trailer was hired out to one landowner to treat giant rat's tail grass in the Cloyner area and splatter guns were used by landowners in the Brooklands, Cloyner and Dangle areas for lantana control. In the wild dog and feral pig control, a total of two landowners were supplied with 400 wild dog baits in the Tarong area and 90 kilograms of meat was injected to manage feral pigs in the iron pot area. And just on that briefly, we've got some pretty exciting news that I will table at the next uh, meeting in November in relation to wild animal and, and dog controls. Uh, we've got some wonderful workshops that's coming up, three workshops that's coming up, and that'll be available to the public. It's been put out there, so that will be some pretty exciting news. Cat traps were hired out to landowners in the Nanango, Jurong and Alice Creek, Boat Mountain and Wandai areas and dog traps were given out in the Crawford area. Pig traps out in the Proston area and steel portable yards were given out to the Kushni area. With rabbit control, carrots were injected with K5 Khaleesi virus and distributed on properties in South Nanango, Waddle Camp, Nanango, Warulan and the Blackbutt areas. With wandering livestock, we received 15 requests to attend to wandering livestock across the region. No cattle were impounded in the month of September, which is a great result because we know with impounding of animals there becomes a cost. Stock root raising permits, at this point in time, no applications were received or processed during September. And with our fire management, South Burnett Rural Fire Brigades completed a prescribed burn at Maidenwell Reserve completing the three priority council burns identified by Regional Fire Management Group for the operation of Cool Burn 2020. Whilst other reserves were scheduled to be burnt this year, COVID social distancing practices have significantly reduced the capacity of the QFES resources to undertake prescribed burns this season. So COVID is affecting everything across the board. With our sale yards, Staff inspected 1,235 head, we dipped 1,222 head and processed 1,619 head for the sale yards in September. A total of 827 head were th sold through the Coolabunya sale yards for a total of $899,959.50. Environmental assessments, natural resources staff completed 33 environmental assessments prior to the commencement of gravel resheeting works and visibility clearing. In planning, extension to the COVID-19 applica applicable event period until the 31st of January 2021. To further support Queensland's economic recovery, the Treasurer and Minister for Planning, Cameron Dick, has extended the COVID-19 applicable event period to the 31st of January 2021. This decision extends the application of current declared uses and approved temporary use licences until the 31st of January 21, and it allows businesses to apply for temporary use licences and for the temporary use licences to be issued until the 31st of January 2021. This extension means that the declaration made by the Minister earlier this year for certain uses or essential businesses to operate 24-hour operations seven days a week to ensure that they can work around the clock in emergency situations to deliver vital goods and services to Queenslanders is applicable until 31 January 2021. In addition, the six months extension to the currency period for current and new planning approvals issued until 31st of October 2021 is now 
also applicable to current and new approval issued up to the 31st of January 2021. All planning approvals that are current or issued between the 8th of July 2020, the date the first declaration was made, and the 31st of January 2021, have an automatic extension of six months to the currency period listed in the approval. In the planning scheme amendments, the proposed administrative amendment to the South Burnett Regional Council planning scheme will be considered by Council at the November meeting. This amendment is proposed to correct administrative errors and do not change the policy direction or zoning of land subject to the planning scheme. The steps to undertake a major amendment of the planning scheme pursuant to the Minister's rules for Section 20 of the Planning Act 2016 commences with Council resolving to undertake a major amendment and adoption of the amended planning scheme within approximately 18 months. Council proposes to seek approval from the Minister to seek a tailored process in order to reduce time frames and undertake steps concurrently where possible. The tailored process can reduce the time frame to approximately 10 months, pending the resources available to Council and extend extent of possible public submissions. In infrastructure charges review, Council is currently exploring options to reduce the impact of the cost for infrastructure charges on developments while ensuring the long-term financial sustainability of Council's infrastructure expenditure. Part of this process includes a public workshop with industry stakeholders to gain a better understanding of the impact the current payment regime has on residential land supply and possible incentives to kickstart land delivery in the South Burnham. It is anticipated that the public workshop will be hosted and a policy announcement made before the end of this year. In compliance in COVID-19 food establishments, events and general inquiries, as COVID-19 restrictions have continued, inquiries have remained strong with additional effort being required from the environmental health officers in order to inform, liaise and provide Advice. Unfortunately, COVID-19 continues to consume a significant amount of time for the Environment and Waste Services section. Staffing Council's Compliance Administration Officer vacancy has finally been filled, as there is a substantial backlog of items it will unfortunately take this new person some time to work through all of these tasks. Also, the long-standing vacancy for an Environmental Health Officer has been filled. A new Environmental Health Officer will start in November this year. So with that, Mayor Otto, I'd like to uh, bring my Rural Services, Natural Resource Management and Planning and Appliance report to be received by Council. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Councillor Henshin. Do we have a second for such? Thanks, Councillor Duff. Uh, does any, question, uh, any Councillor have questions or comments in relation to Councillor's report? Thanks, Councillor Jones. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. Just in, in relation to the infrastructure charges, I think uh, this council has addressed it and um, I'm happy, again, this is something that I've been trying to uh, create or uh, make a difference in the last couple of years, along with the other previous council. The uh, LGIP charges and the headwork charge and all that sort of stuff, you know, I think, and we've made a... Uh, made a, uh, an agreement or we've all come to an agreement that we want something sooner rather than later to help um, create some land. I, uh, in Mergen yesterday I spoke to uh, a couple of real estate agents and they, they were pleading for more land. They're selling land at Moffatdale and all that sort of stuff. There's people fighting over blocks out there that were unheard of before just for an example. So the uh, charges, you know, these charges, um, I'd like to see them staged so that... Um, but anyway, that's, that's to the workshop and all that, but I think that's a, a big step for this council and the region, and we need to get it going as soon as possible because who knows how long this frenzy for land and, and uh, housing and all that will last due to the COVID and all that sort of stuff, so we don't want to miss the boat. So this is a very important step for the, for the council and the region, I believe. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Jones. If I can just say that uh, certainly um, uh, I know under the direction of our CEO, Council staff are uh, undertaking a significant body of work as we speak. Um, be, and uh, in light of the fact that Council is well aware of the urgency of the matter in terms of the provision of residential and industrial land, um, the, uh, the growth spurt in our region uh, has probably come upon us quicker than we thought and uh, no doubt relates to uh, COVID uh, issues. Um, but uh, that, that body of work is certainly progressing 
um, it will be workshop with the community and with council um, and uh, with a view to bring it to a council meeting sooner than later. Uh, Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes, I agree with um, Councillor Jones and your comments. I'm very excited about those um, workshops and the potential of our region in ironing out some of those um, challenges that we face. Uh, certainly, I just have one question in terms of um, your report, Councillor Henshin. You mentioned the major amendment. Um, I just wanted to ask, I was mindful there may be some minor amendments that we may be able to make sooner um, than waiting the 18 month period and certainly uh, respect and appreciate the work that's going into perhaps reducing that to the 10th months. But I had thought in other discussions, we had mentioned there were some minor amendments that may be able to be made to the planning scheme um, sooner. Um, so I just wanted to ask that question. Yeah, thanks General Manager Omay. <laughs> Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, the um, we will be bringing back the minor amendments we're talking about are really just administrative amendments, so they don't necessarily change the policy intent of the planning scheme or the zoning. So, so they're really just um, your typos, administrative errors. Um, the fact that the planning scheme, when you develop that, that goes out to public consultation. It's got to go through ministerial approval. So, you, you have to basically go through that process again because. Um, if you're changing zoning, changing the intents, um, changing code. So it, it really does have to go back for that public feedback, go back that it's um, departmental approval, it's not in conflict with any of the Queensland planning guidelines. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, the, the um, yeah difference between the, those major amendments do have to go back and follow through that process. So the department are working on, on sort of trying to shortcut that, but, yeah, it does take a bit longer. Yeah, thanks, General Thank Manager. Thank you, General Manager Omak. Good, thanks, Councillor Shoemaker, and uh, no doubt that'll be a matter that uh, will um, uh, come under you know, uh, additional conversation uh, over coming weeks um, in terms of Council's uh, appetite and expectation around those planning scheme amendments uh, and the associated timeframes. Uh, it is, of course, a resourcing issue that uh, Council may well need to address if we are looking to bring that forward. Okay. Uh, well, uh, does anyone have any further uh, questions or comments? If not, we'll put that to the vote. Uh, those in favour of acceptance? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you all. Item 12.1 on the agenda at 205 is the Local Disaster Management Water and Wastewater Waste Management Portfolio Report. It's my pleasure to welcome Councillor Froloff. Thanks, Ros. Thank you, Mayor. Local Disaster Management. The South Burnett Local Disaster Management Group is currently at alert. Key agencies within the LDMG continue to meet on a regular basis to ensure that the group remains aware and prepared should there be any further cases of COVID-19 within the South Burnett region. Key members of the Disaster Management Team at Council, at Council attended the Australian Government Judicionary, Judicional preparedness briefing with presentations from QFES, Queensland Health, Emergency, Emergency Management Australia, the Queensland Reconstruction Authority and the Queensland Police Service. The Bureau of Meteorology was also present and presented the seasonal outlook. The Bureau of Meteorology last week announced the predicted wetter than average conditions this year due to the formation of a El Nina La Nina in the Pacific, Tropical Pacific. A media release together with the media publication will be released each day from the 12th to the 18th of October 2020 for the Get Ready Week. Council will be providing many resources, links and videos for your family to build resilience to ensure you are well equipped to deal with the extreme weather and natural disasters which is part of our state. Water and wastewater. Works in, prog uh, in progress and future work summary for September, October 2020 are as follows. Kingaroy, we have the CBD. Alfred Street to Youngman Street to Short. Kingaroy Street to East Side. Kingaroy Street West Side. Haley Street Northern Side. Haley Street South Side. Glendon Street. Youngman Street North and Ream Street. And in Wandai, we have Haley Street from Hodge to Scott Street. And we have regional, across the, across the area, 700 water metres um, being replaced. Restrictions and dam levels. 
as of the 21st of the 9th, 2020. And all towns still remain on level three water restrictions. They are as follows. Bunduma Dam, 31.5%. BP Dam, 13.2%. Gordon Brook Dam, 51.19%. And Boo Bear Dam, 20%. Waste management, the state waste management annual repayment. The repayment from the state for the 2021 financial year will be $1,437,153 based on the 2018-19 waste disposal figures, paid in, quarter, paid in quarterly instalments of $359,288. The July quarterly repayment was received at the end of August 2020. The repayments for the previous financial year, 19, um, 2019-2020, was $1,053,976 and was based on the 2017-2018 waste disposal figures. This is an increase in the repayment amount on the previous financial year of some $383,177. Council ended up being in a deficit concerning payments to the state for the 1920 financial year to the value of $27,352. This equates to 2.6% difference in the 2017-2018 estimates and the waste disposal volume variation for the 2019-20 financial year. Based on the 2018-19 waste disposal figures and how waste volumes have been trending since the introduction of the state waste levy, it is hoped that Council will save more than the previous financial year's deficit from the state's 2021 annual payment. And Mayor, I'd like my portfolio to be um, moved, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Froloff. Do we have a second of such? Thanks, Councillor Potter. Uh, comments, uh, questions, Councillors? Councillor Duff? Um, just a, uh, just a um, question about, well, I guess I don't know whether anyone can answer this, but we were told that, the, that the, through the, the Bureau of Meteorology that the El Nino, we were going to have a wet um, winter, and now that we're going to have a wet spring, I'm just wanting to know if anyone knows when that's going to happen. <laughs> oh, look, Count... <coughs> Councillor uh, <coughs> Duff, uh, thank you for your question. Um, and, and I certainly know that uh, Pastor Andy Duncan um, certainly uh, shared with us uh, uh, the good Lord's uh, support, but I don't know that uh, he's going to give us that information right now today. Uh, it may be a wet summer. Uh, could I also just note that, of course, we've got Gordon Brook Dam tracking towards 50%. Uh, that's a critical point for our council. Um, I know uh, General Manager Meehan with his... Uh, Water staff have been doing a lot of work in this space and we've built a really good relationship with the Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy uh, and Sunwater in managing our water supply. Uh, but that will continue to be an issue that we will work on. And as I uh, stated before, we will be advocating uh, tonight and tomorrow night, continuing to advocate for uh, water uh, for water reliability and security across our region, both in terms of urban water supply, particularly for Kingaroy, uh, and also water for industry and agriculture. Uh, okay, does anyone else have any uh, questions? Uh, Councillor Jones? Yeah, Mr Mayor, just while you uh, refer back to that, I missed the opportunity before, with the uh, candidates for the Nango coming in tonight, are we, is that going to be live streamed? Is that possible? So it will be live streamed so the people of the South Burnett region can view? That's excellent. Yeah, thanks Councillor Jones, and of course, uh, our council um, did produce. Uh, we're one of the councils in Queensland that led the charge in terms of producing a advocacy action plan on behalf of our community. Uh, that's been presented to the government and to the opposition and has now been presented to all five candidates for the seat of Nanango. Uh, that was a comprehensive document that outlined across six key areas uh, those uh, the needs for our region um, and uh, we'll be keen to get a response from those candidates uh, this evening and tomorrow evening uh, in response to that advocacy plan. Our questions will be tailored around that advocacy plan. Today we've talked about roads, we've talked about biosecurity, we've talked about water. They are all key issues for our region and we would be certainly very keen to hear what the candidates are proposing for uh, the good people of the South Burnett. 
All right, yes, Councillor Jones. Yeah, right. I just want to give you, uh, Mr Mayor, another opportunity. Uh, we had a catch-up meeting with the Council yesterday. Maybe you might like to uh, uh, confirm that we are campaigning right across the state. There's LGAQ president is up for grabs. Maybe you want to just let the people know what, what you've done yesterday with the phone calls. Yeah, thanks, uh, Councillor Jones. And of course, this is very relevant to water. Water is a key issue, and must acknowledge the work that was undertaken by the previous council uh, under the uh, under the um, uh, leadership of uh, of Mayor Keith Campbell in acquiring the funding for the uh, for the water feasibility study. Uh, and this council has simply picked up the ball where Keith and his and you guys left off and continue with that work. Um, and in addition to water, we are advocating uh, through the Wide Bay Burnett region of councils. Uh, through Webrock. Um, that's the Wide Bay Regional uh, Advocacy Group that we would seek funding through. Um, we also work, of course, with the state and federal governments, and this is simply part of our process of advocating to the state government. Now, of course, the Local Government Association of Queensland, the LGAQ, uh, do play a very important role in supporting councils in lobbying for funding and for programs that are going to benefit the regions of Queensland. And uh, part of that process at the, of, at the moment, uh, the LGAQ are certainly focused on the election. They were very instrumental in, in, in supporting our council in accessing $3.3 million in COVID funding. Uh, and they'll continue to, to do that. Now, part of that process, the LGAQ presidency um, is uh, has come around again and at conference next week on the Gold Coast, uh, our council will be asked to vote between one of two candidates, Mr CEO. Um, and yesterday, uh, we had a very productive teleconference with one of those candidates, uh, Jenny Hill from Townsville, um, and we'll be happy to do the same uh, in the next couple of days with Mark Jemison from the Sunshine Coast. Of course, the role of president of the LGAQ is a very important one in supporting our councils in advocating to government. Uh, so we'll be voting on that uh, next week at conference and um, we really appreciate, I think, the conversation, Councillor Jones, that we had um, with uh, Mayor Jenny Hill yesterday. Um, her passion for uh, advocacy for rural regional councils uh, out of Townsville is very strong, but she also seemed to have a very good understanding of what southern rural regional councils need as well. I think I can speak for all councillors in saying that it was quite, um, quite uh, promising to hear her vision for the LGAQ. Uh, and we'll be very much looking forward to hearing the same from Mayor Jemison on the Sunshine Coast prior to uh, making our decision. Right, uh, so thanks, Councillor Jones, for that. Uh, thanks very much, Councillor Froloff. Uh, all those in favour of acceptance of the report, thank you. Resolution passed unanimously. We'll now move on uh, to item 13.1, uh, which at, is at 206, and it's the Rural Resilience Parks and Gardens Property and Facility Management and Indigenous Affairs Portfolio Report, and it's my pleasure to welcome Councillor Duff. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. So the first item is rural resilience. Our first 10 minutes with a master was held at Maidenwell last week. It was very successful with Council Rates Team Leader participating as one of the masters. We also had Council's Coordinator of Infrastructure Support talking to locals around the disaster dashboard. The feedback that we got from the service providers was by taking it out to the rural community of Maidenwell, it brought in local farmers that probably would not have travelled to a bigger centre to seek help. The next one is this Friday at Bowie Hall. There will be one at Mondial on the 22nd of October and the final one will be held at Burren Down on the 29th of October. Thank you to Council's local disaster recovery administration officer in particular who has played a big role in organising these events. Parks and Gardens, Proston, Heisel and Jurong. The disposal of chemical toilet waste in the Heisel amenities caused a failure of the on-site septic system, requiring the closure of the facility for almost a week. I would like to remind the visitors and residents of our region that chemical toilet waste can only be disposed of at an appropriate dump point. The shade sale was removed from the small playground beside the old Proston Hall and general maintenance of the area continues. In Kingaroy, Staff removed old timber sleepers from around playground equipment, removed all of the old damaged softfall in Rotary Park. Garden beds have also been rotary hoed and tidied up. Staff have installed three seats in the Apex Park lookout. Coordinated tree trimming to accommodate street sweeper. The street sweeper has been completed in the areas that were causing issues. All other street trees have been pruned or removed where needed in the river road North Street Drain Carry Drive areas. The landscaping of Alfred Street Car Park and Rogers Drive roundabout has now been finalised and general maintenance continues across the area. 
Tabinga Cemetery has received a tidy up with the old damaged concrete edging removed. Garden and general maintenance continues. In uh, Wandai, Mergen and S Wandai Mergen Cemeteries, general maintenance, mowing and weed eating continues around the area with staff also attending to tree pruning, pruning and removals and customer service requests with the rail trial program for October. The cemetery maintenance has been the main focus with fence lines in Memorambi, Wandai and Tingura being cleared and tidied up along with Wandai Sports Ground fence line. Irrigating in the lawn area continues twice a week in Wandai and Mergen. Work also commenced to realign the plaques in the lawn cemetery as the dry weather continues to cause soil movement in these areas. Parks team installed the Mergen pool shade sails in preparation for the upcoming season. Nanengo and surrounding areas. Nanengo Cemetery has had a clean up and most trees pruned. Streets, parks and surrounding reserves trees have been pruned and all dead trees removed for safety in parks. Works in the CBD area has been a focus for September with all timber oiling completed and the automatic irrigation is progressing in some of the main street gardens. General maintenance continues throughout the district. The Maidenwell community has been working towards finalising the layout of the footpath around the public amenities and cenotaph areas. Our dams, BP Dam, the day area and camping areas have continued to be maintained. The gutters on cabins and building have been cleared and tree maintenance has been completed throughout the park in readiness for the upcoming storm season. Storage sheds have been cleaned and general maintenance continues on these buildings. The magpie season is in full swing and signs have been installed around the park to alert visitors to their presence. Council staff cleaned and set up for the fishing comp prior to the event. Preparations have begun for the upcoming Troy Casadale concert. Baduma Dam. Baduma has also seen good numbers of visitors during the September period. Similarly, the gutters on cabins and buildings have been clean, cleared and tree maintenance has been completed throughout the park in readiness for the upcoming storm season. Turf around cabins has been loamed following the completion of the pathways. Day area and all grounds have been fully mowed, weed eated and weed sprayed. Cabin and building gutters have been cleaned and general maintenance continues. The local magpies have also been active and signs have been installed to notify visitors of their presence. Council staff set up marquees and ensured the area was well presented prior to the two fishing competitions. With the COVID-19 border restrictions, it seems more Queenslanders are rediscovering our fantastic region, with both dams report, reporting significant increases in visit numbers for the month of September. So Lake Penduma occupancy was in 2019 was 836 and in 2020 at the same time, 1,945, an increase of 1,109. And in Bielke Peterson, gone from 694 to 1,309, an increase of 615. Signage remains in all parks and amenities. Cleaning process is still undertaken by park staff every week. Playground equipment is high pressure cleaned and disinfected. Um, this is with the COVID-19. Sorry, I missed that. Um, signage remains in all parks and amenities. Cleaning process is still undertaken by park staff every week. Playground equipment is high pressure cleaned and disinfected. High use amenity blocks are cleaned daily and disinfected daily in Proston, Heisel, Mergen and Wandai and weekly in all other areas. Additional soap dispensers have been installed at multiple amenities. Toilet rolls continue to be a target in most of our amenities, including the use of battery toilet roll spooling devices to particularly target the jumbo rolls. Property and facility maintenance management. Swimming season has commenced. All swimming pools open for the September school holidays. Heat pumps, solar systems and blankets are fully operational, operational in the council owned swimming pools. Water temperature is warming up. Pool managers are anticipating attendance to increase as we move into the warmer months. Everyone that enters the council pool facility will need to complete sign-in and sign-out documentation, sanitise hands and not enter if they are unwell or sick. Pool managers are taking bookings for swimming lessons and exercise classes. The community is encouraged to directly contact the pool managers. Contact details can be found on the council's website. Quotations have been called for re-roofing floor covers, external and internal painting within council buildings. Quotations have been called for floor sanding of timber floors for some of council halls and heritage buildings. Council has called for quotations for design and reprinting some of the signs within the Kingaroy Vic Museum and Art Gallery. 
Design works have commenced on the Wandai Showgrounds Grandstand and the Nanengo Cultural Centre Air Conditioning and Louvre Window Replacement Project. Council is seeking tenders for the lease of land at Jurong for development as a fuel outlet. Part of Lot 1 on RP50789. The intended outcome of the tender is to provide private enterprise with the opportunity to develop an unmanned fuel outlet at the intersection of two major regional roads, Chinchilla Wandai Road and Madaba Jurong Road at Jurong. The development of a fuel outlet at the location will support the transport and rural sectors in the region and facilitate economic development within the South Burnett. The tender documents are available from LG Tender Box website, www w.lgtenderbox.com.au from Thursday the 8th of October 2020 and the tender will close on the 10th of November. And finally with Indigenous Affairs, bite nights are starting again and will be held monthly with the first one being held on Saturday night the 24th of October at the Mergen Pool. This has been a very successful program with Mergen and Sherberg communities working with the PCYC to help address youth crime. The statistics are showing that this initiative, along with work done by Youth Justice, the Police, CTC and a whole of community effort has helped with a huge reduction in youth crime. Through Council's Indigenous Affairs budget, we have provided some funding to the Southburn Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander group for painted face masks. This project has been all done in the South Burnett with the artwork being done by Val McGrath, the sewing by Kingaroy and Blackbutt Yarram and CWA and the printing at Zeebs Printing in Kingaroy. Council has also helped with funding towards Indigenous painting of three industrial bins at the top of the Bunya Avenue near Allen Sterling Park at the Bunya Mountains. The artwork is led by Miri Danan Anderson, who is an accomplished Waka Waka artist. JJ Richards have given their approval and have provided new company stickers for the bins. This project provides local artists the opportunity to express their connection to country, exhibit their work on, on country, and tell their stories through art for all who pass by. And that concludes my report. Thank you. I'd like to move my report. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Duff. Do we have a seconder? Thanks, Councillor Henshin. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Councillor Duff, you mentioned magpies, that they've put the magpie signs up. Um, I'm sure, like a lot of the councillors, we've all had phone calls with, with regards to magpies and magpie issues and magpie attacks. Um, we can't do anything about the magpies, that's correct? Um, I might hand over to the general manager, but as far as I'm aware, we can only just put signs up. We can't actually relocate them, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah through you, Miss Mayor. Yeah, that's, that's correct. We, there is very limited action we can take with that. And, and even if it does get to the extreme case and and you look at relocation, then, then generally another magpie will move in and, and the behaviour will continue. Um, so, yeah, generally it's, it's a warning sign and for people to be aware. Oh, yeah, can also just um, make aware that Council's uh, media staff, comm staff, did release a um, publication out to the community through all of our different platforms as to uh, effective strategies for managing the magpie season. So well done to them. Uh, Councillor Schumacher. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to comment. It's great to see our visitor economy is really growing and flowing through the region. Um, to see those stats and the increase in visitors to both Banduba Dam and BP Dam, Banduba up 1,109 visitors and BP Dam 615 visitors. That's enormous. I was just out there a couple of weekends ago, took the kids in the boat out and took the tube for a run around the dam. It was great to see so many people um, enjoying camping with their family. And I did do a bit of a spot audit of the facilities um, while I was there. And I'm pleased to say everything looked really, really fabulous. So well done to the team. It's really green and, and, and quite well maintained and looking really good at Bandumba Dam. I just think um, those numbers, they're again sort of... Um, I guess, inform Council's approach in terms of building a plan, a master plan for both of our dams into the future to really elevate them as premier tourist attractions. There's clearly the um, visitor economy there to support that kind of investment in those dams and continued investment. So I'm just really pleased to see um, they're being well maintained and, and I think uh, certainly with the increase in visitors uh, exploring their own backyard at the moment. There's a great opportunity 
for us as a council to really continue to grow their name and encourage more people to our region. So well done to the team and um, I look forward to my next trip out to the dam definitely and those discussions about that master plan. Thanks, Councillor Shoemaker. Um, well, there's quite a lot of that report. Thanks, Councillor Duff. Um, again, a lot of the things that are undertaken there, thanks to the uh, work for Queensland funding that Council received from the Queensland Government, the community drought funding from the Federal Government, and of course, Council's only contribution to our CapEx budget in relation to a lot of those uh, projects across the region. Uh, I'd like to again acknowledge the work done by uh, Officer Linda O'May uh, as our local um, disaster recovery admin officer, as Councillor Duff acknowledged there. It's a big job organising these uh, 10 minutes with a master uh, activities. They're very important to our rural people uh, in terms of their mental health as they continue to battle with what has been decades of drought. Uh, so Councillor O'May's role often is it noticed as core business of council, but very, very significant business of council. Uh, so well done to her on that. Great effort. The um, fence line at the Wandai Sports Ground drove through there and it looks great, doesn't it? The entry in and out of Wandai, Parks and Garden staff have done a great job and as Councillor Shoemaker said, wow, what an increase in numbers at our two dams. Uh, a reflection on Council's commitment to tourism, uh, the work that was done there by uh, the, the staff involved in getting us to this point where we could have the dams open under very challenging circumstances with COVID compliance requirements has been tremendous. And of course, the new managers must be congratulated on the work they've done. Uh, Lake Boonduma up over 100% on last year's September figures. Amazing. Um, and and, uh, and uh, Bajoki Peterson, again, up almost 100% on September last year. It just shows that uh, good to go Queensland is certainly working in our region. Queenslanders are out there supporting and exploring our backyard. Uh, the COVID work by the Parks and Gardens crew is often unnoticed in cleaning the facilities. Uh, I think that needs to be acknowledged as well. Well done. And of course, the Youth Crime in Mergen, a great community partnership with Queensland Police. The Police Minister is well aware of it. The Police Minister has mentioned it in Parliament uh, as to what a great community effort it was from our council and from the community. Mergen's youth crime is almost well, is negligible compared to what it was two years ago. A great news story and a model for Queensland, I would have thought. So, well done, the great report. Okay, does any other councillor wish to comment? Uh, if not, uh, all those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you all. 14.1 uh, is the Economic Development Portfolio Report at 207. My pleasure to welcome Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'm pleased to report councillors currently from an economic development stimulator and planning incentives point of view. I'm pleased to report councillors currently investigating a range of potential incentives designed to stimulate development activity in our region. Over this next month, council will continue to workshop and discuss these initiatives aimed to make it easier for developers to do business with council. This includes consideration of potential discounts to LGIP charges and adopting more flexible payment timeframes in a way that I believe will encourage immediate economic growth and employment opportunities in the South Burnett region. Council has engaged in some preliminary discussions about its customer service charter and expectations and the value in streamlining the assessment and turnaround timeframes for all building, planning and development applications. It's my view these initiatives will stimulate further development activity, providing opportunities for longer term job creation and assist in terms of affording affordable housing in our region. I look forward to these continued discussions with my fellow colleagues and the report to be brought before council for decision. Can I just amend that to say by the end of this, uh, by the end of this year and following council, Councillor Henshin's comments regarding the workshops yet to occur with our community. Recreation cycling and adventure tourism. The South Burnett is fortunate to have established trail networks and cycling infrastructure and I'm pleased to report its reputation as a cycling and mountain biking destination is growing. Earlier this month I met with the South Burnett Mount Mountain Bike Club Secretary and Anango Cycling President to share ideas and discuss opportunities to grow recreation, cycling and adventure tourism in our region. According to the data collected by these groups, there has been significant increase on the number of trail users in comparison to 2019. And I'm pleased to report 
Over 800 passes were made on the Wandai Rail Trail counter in August, and another three to 400 passes were made on the counters at the Wandai Mountain Bike Trails. And the two circuit rides that form the Link Trail at Nanango are reporting around 300 cyclists per month during the winter season. This data, combined with the growing number of domestic tourists looking to explore their own backyard, the diversity of our natural assets, our ideal location and proximity to major centres such as Brisbane, Gympie, Toowoomba and the coast, it means we are well positioned for further investment in recreation, cycling and adventure tourism. I'd like to acknowledge the extensive community support that has seen thousands of volunteer hours dedicated community fundraising and a significant investment made by both council and our local business community through both sponsorship and in-kind support to get these trails and assets to the impressive standard in which they are today. As per Mountain Bike Australia's detailed Queensland Mountain Bike Strategy, the rapid growth and changing market trends are demanding greater diversity in mountain biking experiences, and this requires a coordinated approach to future investment in mountain biking infrastructure. It's my view we have an opportunity to build on the hard work and commitment of our volunteers and capitalise on the sustainable development of trails, facilities and infrastructure in a way that aligns with these market trends and elevates the South Burnett as a premier destination for recreation, cycling and adventure tourism. It's my view Council has a key role to play in continuing to partner with these organisations in ways that attracts further funding and continues to grow our visitor economy by leveraging our existing investment in the rail trail. As my fellow councillors know, Council entered into a partnership agreement with South Burnett Mountain Bike Club and has provided some in-kind support to help with the development of a mountain bike park at Gordonbrook Dam. In my meeting at the park, I walked their new mountain bike trail, which climbs over logs, weaves through rocks and offers a unique and quite beautiful challenge through what was previously vacant land. This trail has been made possible through some grant funding that the South Burnett Mountain Bike Club were successful in and is almost ready for opening. It's just awaiting some further um, funding for advisory signage. While I was there, the club secretary provided me with an understanding for the grant grand concept to develop the space into a premier destination mountain bike park. A place for amateur riders, families, professionals and e even world-class riders to build their skills, explore and enjoy the diversity of our region's landscapes. I'm keen to continue this collaboration by working with this group to seek further funding and look to ways in which we can together bring our shared vision to create a premier destination mountain bike park here in the South Burnett to fruition. I look forward to further discussions with my fellow colleagues about the potential of this project. 2020-21, the year of Indigenous tourism. In September, I attended Southern Queensland Country Tourism's Conversation with Industry, hosted by Tourism and Events Queensland, and learned about the 2020-21 year of Indigenous tourism aim to increase the profile and understanding of Indigenous tourism experiences in Queensland. I learn more about the industry trends that demonstrate there is a growing demand for authentic cultural experiences. It's my understanding the Year of Indigenous Tourism is set to celebrate our First Nations experiences in Queensland and attract people from all around the world to learn and experience more about one of the world's oldest living cultures. I would like to see the South Burnett become a partner in identifying these opportunities and I've had some early conversations with the Department of State Development, Tourism and Innovation who are working towards developing a pipeline of Indigenous tourism opportunities across the state. I look forward to continuing these discussions and working with our neighbouring regions of Sherberg, Toowoomba and Western Downs to work together and acknowledge the cultural places of significance in our respective regions and share the stories of our First Nations people in a respectful, meaningful and culturally appropriate way. Agritourism opportunities. Over this past month, I met with committee members from the Farm to Fork Collective, Saucy Fork Chef and local paddock to plate producer from High Brit Beef to learn more about their vision for agritourism in the South Burnett. As you know, our region is home to many incredible producers who work tirelessly every day to get their food and products onto supermarket shelves. 
At this meeting, I learned more about the thousands of kilometres our food travels and the consequent consequential effects on carbon emissions and the impacts on the freshness of our groceries. The farm to fork concept is about eating locally, supporting farmers, our community and tourism tourists to understand where their food comes from. Spanning from the idea of creating a permanent farmer's market, the aim is to provide one central store in the South Burnett where you can buy all of what our region produces in the same place. Just this last weekend, I was humbled by the opportunity to chair the first AGM, and I'm currently working with the group to understand the funding opportunities on offer and how we can work together to further grow agritourism in the South Burnett. I've also met with the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries to understand some of the agritourism projects underway in our region. I look forward to these continued discussions and bringing information back to Council in ways that will enable us to be a part of growing our visitor economy in the areas of agritourism. Visit South Bennett, meeting with Southern Queensland Country Tourism and T Tourism Events Queensland. I'm pleased to report CEO Mark Pitt and I joined the Visit South Bennett um, executive members in meeting with Tourism and Events Queensland CEO Leanne Coddington, Destination Director out back in Queen Country T Queensland. Matt Bron and Southern Queensland Country Tourism Chair Dr Jane Summers and CEO Peter Homan. The meeting offered an opportunity to discuss further collaboration in the South Burnett and potential funding opportunities for the local tourism organisation Visit South Burnett. The meeting was positive and challenged all of us to think about how we can work together to grow our visitor economy and strengthen the tourism industry in our region. I see the development of South Burnett's tourism strategy critical to our way forward. It's my view that without a clear strategy, it's difficult for our region to drive outcomes that encourage collaboration across all stakeholder groups. This is a project in which I see Council playing a partnership role with Southern Queensland Country Tourism, Visit South Burnett and our local champions of the tourism industry and business community to define our shared vision, our priorities, and who will be accountable to these. This strategy would help Council to ensure its investment in infrastructure supports the quality of life of our residents while meeting the needs of the tourism industry. I've been seeking some advice about how we may be able to embark on this journey together and support the many direct and indirect businesses and community groups who are driving tourism outcomes in our region. It's my view our sustainability as a region depends on our ability to work together in ways that serve our shared interests and needs and empower the tourism industry and local business community to lead the change we want to see and deliver tangible outcomes for our region. Creative Together Plan 2020-2030. It's my view that creativity is a catalyst for possibility, innovation and economic opportunity. It was a great pleasure to explore this further at last week's South Burnett Arts Hour session with special guest Stephen Clark on the topic of creative collaboration for community benefit. It was great to be involved in that discussion with Councillor Potter and Mayor Otto as well. Stephen explored the important role of arts, culture and heritage in our economy and how it influences our quality of life. The Creative Together 2020-2030 plan is the Queensland Government's 10-year roadmap for arts, culture and creativity and I'm keen to work with Councillor Potter and our region's many artists and performers to together strengthen our arts community and find ways to build new partnerships and collaborate on exciting projects and concepts that will help drive economic outcomes and support our region to thrive. I'd like to move that my report be accepted. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Shoemaker. Have a second. Thanks, Councillor Potter. Questions or comments from councillors? No? Well, uh, look, a very comprehensive report there and um, great to see over 800 passes on the Wando Road Trail in August uh, and also uh, the Nango, on the Nango circuit. So that was a, a good indication we have, again, many people moving through our region. Right, all those in favour of acceptance of the report? Resolution passed unanimously. Thank you, councillors. Moving on now to... Uh, Item 15, notice of motion. Uh, we don't have any, so uh, we'll move on. Uh, item 16, 209, list of correspondence pending completion of assessment report. And uh, we have there two items. 
There, so the officer's recommendation is the list of correspondence pending completion of assessment port be received. There's a two items there noted in the agenda. I have a mover for such. Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Second, thank you, Councillor Frailoff. Those in favour? Thank you, Councillors. Resolution passed unanimously. Right, uh, we've now completed uh, the uh, section of the, uh, the open section of the meeting. Uh, we'll, we now be moving into closed session. But before we do that, I would like to acknowledge um, General Manager Susan Jarvis and congratulate you on behalf of Council for your first year's anniversary in joining our Council. Now, of course, uh, I've come to know Councillor Jarvis over the last six months as being someone who's uh, got a wealth of knowledge and experience in local government. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, I think we all know uh, the contribution that you've made over the first year. It's been a great year. And can I only say, may you have many more with our Council. Uh, congratulations, uh, General Manager Jarvis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Thank you, councillors. Ah. Appreciate it. As well in relation to that. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, it's 12 months today. So, um, and General Manager Jarvis, we've got um, this last 12 months allowed us to consolidate our entire executive, senior executive team, and looking forward to many, many years of working with all three. Thanks, Mr. CEO. Thanks very much, General Manager Jarvis, and we really look forward to having a great term of council with you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now we're moving into confidential section. So um, the officer's recommendation is that council considers the confidential reports listed below in a meeting closed to the public in accordance with section 275 of the Local Government Regulation 2012. We have items there 17.1 through to 17.7, .7, as stated in the agenda. Would somebody like to move that we move out of close, Danita, and seconded by uh, Scott Engine, uh, Councillor Engine, sorry. <laughs> All in favour. <laughs> All righty. Okay, so you'll have that on the screen. Okay, so uh, our uh, Mayor is currently out of the chamber due to a uh, conflict, the declared conflict of interest on 17.4, uh, sorry, purchase of the commercial property fronting Kingaroy Street, Kingaroy. Officers recommendation that in accordance with section 257 of the Local Government Act 2009, Council delegate power to the Chief Executive Officer to negotiate the purchase of Lot 1 on RP 133329, the former trendsetter premises at 195 Kingaroy Street, Kingaroy, and that Council release funds from restricted cash to purchase the property. Could I have a uh, mover, please? Danita, Councillor Potter, a seconder. Councillor Henshin, uh, do we need to ask for any comments or just, is there any comments before we uh, take a vote on that in regards to the purchase? Okay, all in favour? Thank you. Uh, resolution passed unanimously. I'll now uh, ask for the uh, Mayor to return back to the Chamber and I will hand it over to him to uh, continue on with the other issues. Okay, uh, item 17.1 is the uh, animal impoundment fee waiver request. So I'll just get that here. Okay, so uh, I'd like to, um, like to move that due to the uh, extraordinary and unique circumstances uh, <coughs> of the applicant. Council approve the request for the waiver of the unregistered dog impoundment fee of $215. And that such approval does in no way constitute 
Council's intention to create a precedent as to the application of Council's fees and charges policy. We have a seconder for such. Yeah. Councillor Shoe Shoemaker, sorry, thank you. Right, uh, any councillor wish to speak for or against the matter? Um, just a clarification. Councillor Duff. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Just a clarification. I think it is it um, we're wa is, shouldn't it be the unregistered? Shouldn't it be the waiver of the impoundment fee? Because it, well, it's not it's not an unregistered dog. No, excuse me, Councillor Duff. Uh, it is the unregistered dog impoundment fee. Oh, is it? I which is a, a different levy to oh, the registered okay, dog impoundment nice. fee. Thank okay. you, uh, Councillor Councillor Froloff. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, um, I'm for this because council's been told lately that we've got no compassion in this council, and I'd like to beg to differ. This gentleman, he's elderly, he's just lost his wife. The dog's 15 years old, and that, and um, it was privately picked up and brought into the RSPCA, so council hasn't incurred any costs. So I am for giving this waiver to this gentleman. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Froloff. Those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. 17.2. Officer's recommendation is that council grant a 50% rebate on the food licenses, food business licenses to Pete's Pies and Rocket Roadshow in response to their request for a fee reduction to provide financial relief because of the adverse impact of the coronavirus upon their business. Do we have a mover for such? Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Second, I thank you, Councillor Froloff. For or against? Speakers? No. Those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. 17.3. Council contributes payment of $4,854.86 to Wondai Garden Expo for the relocation of electricity and water outlets at Wondai Sports Ground. Do we have a mover? Councillor Duff, thank you. Seconder, thank you, Councillor Potter. Uh, speakers for or against? Those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. 17.5 is in relation to the uh, officers, uh, in relation to rates uh, exemption, remission. So it's a rem it is recommended that council agree to provide a rates remission. So uh, the officer's recommendation is uh, council agree to provide a rate remission for assessment number 10514-5100-000, effective from 1 July 2020, for 100% of the general rates, 100% of the separate rates and charges, and 75% of water and wastewater access charges in line with similar community organisations. Do we have a mover? Thank you, Councillor Schumacher. Second, I thank you, Councillor Henschen. Those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously. 17.6. Officer's recommendation is that Council agree to immediately suspend all current and future legal action for assessment number 10542-00000. Dash triple zero. Request the owner enter a payment arrangement for same assessment number for forty dollars per week, commencing one January two thousand and twenty-one. With the view to clearing all outstanding amounts within a two-year period, payments of forty dollars per week or one hundred and forty-five dollars per month are to continue until the rate arrears are cleared and rates are up to date. No interest will be charged on overdue rates if the agreed payments are maintained. The payment this payment plan will be reviewed on thirty June two thousand and twenty-one or at other times if council is advised that the applicant's circumstances have changed significantly, this payment plan will expire upon payment in full of all outstanding rates and charges, and the general manager finance and corporate will be authorised to negotiate a suitable payment plan should the applica applicant reject or vary the payment plan discussed above. Do we have a mover? Thanks, Councillor Potter. Seconder. Thanks, Councillor Froloff. Those in favour? Resolution passed unanimously, 17.7. Officer's recommendation that Council agree to immediately suspend all current and future legal action for assessment number 30278 dash whatever five zeros is, 000 dash triple zero, sorry, dash 100. Uh, 
request the owner enter, enter into a payment arrangement for same assessment number for $23 per week commencing 1 January 2021 with a view to clearing all outstanding amounts within a two year period. Payments of $23 per week or $90 per month are to continue until the rate arrears are cleared and rates are up to date. No interest will be charged on overdue rates if the agreed payments are maintained. This payment plan will be reviewed 30 June 21 or at other times if council is advised that the applicant's circumstances have changed significantly. This payment plan will expire upon payment in full of all outstanding rates and charges and the General Manager Finance and Corporate will be authorised to negotiate a suitable, suitable payment plan should the applicant reject or vary the payment plan discussed above. Do we have a mover? Thank you Councillor Duff for a second. Thank you Councillor Potter. Those in favour?